humans are making more waste than ever before. From the food we eat, clothes we wear, to the items we use once and toss in the trash. Now, people around the world are starting to treat waste as a commodity that can be reused. Put into buildings, or made into new materials we don't even have names for yet. Here are 16 stories from around the globe about dealing with worldwide waste. This is one of Nigeria's first tire recycling businesses. Workers start by ripping out the steel wires so the rubber can be cut, shredded, and turned into bricks for driveways and playgrounds. So this is softer and actually a bit bouncier. Iferolapo Runshewe started Free Recycle back in 2018. Now, her company recycles hundreds of tires per day. We have over 400,000 tires stockpiled on site. But it's only a tiny slice of the problem. Humans throw out around a billion tires every year. Recycling them gets expensive and complicated. So in most countries, they just pile up in landfills. And here in Nigeria, they can help spread malaria. We have stagnant water that can then become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So why is it so hard to recycle tires? And why are tire graveyards so dangerous? More than half of all the cars in Nigeria are in and around its biggest city, Lagos. So there's a good chance old tires will end up with a roadside mechanic like Samwe. Maybe you are going on the road, you have a flat tire, I will repair it for you. He saves any tire he can't fix to sell to free recycle. Samwe and other shop owners, like Adams, make about 30 cents for each tire. It's good, it's good, it's good, because that's this tire is condemned before. Cannot use for anything before, before. So, but now, can, I can sell for free company. Today's haul will be stored in the lot behind Free Recycle's two and a half acre facility. When Ifedolapo wanted to launch the business, no one believed she could make money out of a pile of tires. They kind of looked at us like we're crazy, and generally that was the reaction. But now she has more than 100 full-time employees, and the business makes about 16 cents for every recycled tire. My first tire, the first baby was recycled in, in October 2020. The first challenge is removing the steel wires embedded within the rubber. So one of her first investments was this machine called the D-Beater, which removes them in about 20 seconds. Next, the tires head to this chopper, which cuts each one into four or five pieces, making them easier to work with. The company can process about 150 car tires per hour. The same things that make tires durable also make them hard to recycle. In the 1800s, Charles Goodyear accidentally dropped rubber treated with sulfur onto a stove and discovered a process to harden the material called vulcanization. It made rubber stronger and resistant to extreme temperatures. Exactly what cars need out of tires. As more Americans started driving, rubber production exploded in the early 20th century. And most of it came from plantations in Southeast Asia. And then World War II happened. The verdict is in on rubber. The enemy now has over 90% of the world's source of raw rubber. The Allies needed a lot of rubber for trucks, cars, and planes. The U.S. asked its major manufacturers to find an additional source. Synthetic rubber, one of wartime's newest industries, one of America's modern miracles. Today's tires are a blend of natural and synthetic rubber, reinforced with metal and plastic fibers to make them more durable. But no matter how tough they are, they don't last forever and all of the old rubber quickly piled up. By the end of the 20th century, the U.S. had accumulated well over a billion old tires. In landfills, they can leach toxins, and when buried, they can sometimes trap methane or other gases and literally float to the surface. They also burn fairly easily. In 1987, about 30 acres of tires caught fire in Colorado. It took almost a week to put them out, and the incident brought this kind of waste into the national spotlight. Within a few years, all but two states passed laws that helped fund a new tire scrap industry. By 2021, 
the U.S. had reduced the number of stockpiled tires to just 50 million. Now, America burns a third of its used tires to fuel cement kilns and paper mills, and another third are turned into rubber surfaces like artificial turf. Less than 20% ends up in landfills. But in developing countries like Nigeria, tire waste is still a growing problem. The country ranks in the bottom 10% worldwide for recycling and sustainability. But Free Recycle is aiming to change that. At the factory outside of Lagos, the shredder rips tires into chunks. These drums crush them into even smaller pieces. Workers rake the remnants over vibrating screens. And large vacuums prevent rubber dust from filling the factory air. Pieces five millimeters and smaller fall through. Larger chunks go back through the process and get crushed again. Magnets pull out any remaining metal shards. So here is the fiber separator where the fibers have been separated from the chrome rubber. These are reinforcement fibers, usually made of plastic, nylon, or some other synthetic material. Now, all that remains is rubber. The final vibrating screen separates the different sizes. Powder, which will give a softer feel suitable for playgrounds and gyms, and three to five millimeter crumbles, which are durable enough to use for driveways. To make those pavers, rubber crumbs twirl inside heated mixers polyurethane binder helps hold everything together. It took a long time to figure out the right ratio that could work in Nigeria's tropical savanna climate. A mix or a formulation that would work in, let's say, Europe, wouldn't necessarily work here. So, you know, you just have to find what works best. Dyes adjust the color. A small layer of the colored mixture goes into the mold first. Then the rest of the brick is filled in with undyed rubber mix which helps cut down on manufacturing costs. Then it is pressed down by hand and loaded onto trays. After loading it, it's been rolled to the hydraulic press where we, where we press all the mixed material for proper compression. Finally, it sits in an oven to dry for up to eight hours. Nigeria's unreliable electric grid means the factory has to make most of the power it uses. 80% of our power is generated internally from diesel power generating sets. Workers tap the dried pavers out of the molds. On a typical day, they make roughly enough pieces to cover an entire tennis court. Every tire produces about 25 of these dog bone shaped rubber bricks. Now, they're ready to ship. Scrap tires have become a $12 billion global industry. In the US, Europe, and Japan, most get recycled and many are burned to create energy. Tire-based fuel costs less than natural gas and burns cleaner than coal. But it still produces emissions comparable to other fossil fuels. In another method called pyrolysis, tires are heated to extreme temperatures without oxygen. Advocates claim it's the cleanest way to recycle them, but it requires a lot of energy, leaving small profit margins. In the U.S., a third of recycled tires become new surfaces in homes and playgrounds or mulch for gardens. In response to public concerns about shredded rubber leaking toxins, one U.S. federal agency said it couldn't prove there were any health risks, but it recommended that kids should not eat the rubber. Sound advice. Back in Lagos, Free Recycle's top-selling items are paving stones used in playgrounds like this one at an international school. We've been very happy with their service. Um, the product's good. The thick rubber provides a nice bounce for children at play, but also makes repairs and additions easier. If you want to add more services or add more structures, you just remove it and, and when you finish, put it back. While Free Recycle aims to eliminate all of Nigeria's tire dumps, for now, this waste stream is still growing. But that's not Ifedalapo's only concern. The mother of two is raising a family and a business together. She says Free Recycle is on the verge of becoming profitable, and she continues building it brick by brick. I think she's a, like a natural fixer. She saw a problem. She found a solution. Charming, but she's disturbingly efficient. She plans to expand throughout the country, as well as Rwanda, Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Kenya. I would like to see us uh, tackling more waste 
different types of waste, your paper waste, electronic waste, uh, pet bottle. That's why our tagline is Waste to Wealth. Hotels throw out millions of bars of used soap every week. But they don't have to go in the trash. Recycling soap can be as simple as shaving the surface with potato peelers. We would sit here and just scrape it off and make sure it was cleaned up and good to go. That was 14 years ago. Today, Sean Siepler's company, Clean the World, runs a factory that can handle thousands of bars an hour. And across the Atlantic, in Lyon, France, the team at Unisoap turns the waste into new bars they say are completely sanitary. Both companies donate their products to the homeless and children in developing countries. But as these nonprofits perfect the process of dealing with this type of trash, hotels have started to cut back on individually wrapped hygiene products, and some countries are even considering banning them entirely. We traveled to France and Florida to see how these two companies help people clean themselves with worldwide waste. A second-hand bar of soap isn't as gross as it might seem. Yes, there's probably dirt, hair, dead skin cells, and bacteria on there. But when you wash, soap molecules bind to the germs and natural oils on your skin. While these molecules attract grease and grime, they repel water. Running water pushes the soap molecules, along with all that captured filth, off your skin, safely away from you. So even a contaminated bar is safe to clean your hands with. The bar of soap may have microbes on it, but it probably won't make you sick. In fact, the simple act of hand washing can wash away something as serious as the Ebola virus. Still, both Unisoap and Clean the World follow extra guidelines to clean their bars. Here's how Unisoap collects thousands of bars from hotels in France. So, une semaine de collecte. First, all grime left from the hotel guests must be removed. The team installed peelers into a table to take off the outer layers. Trois fois, à chaque fois, pareil, une rotation pour être sûr que tout soit bien effacé. Et tu vois, il y a plus. Euh... The peelers are razor sharp, so workers wear special gloves to protect their fingers. They inspect every bar. The company claims scraping alone is enough to maintain a sanitary process, but it's a lot of work. L'étape de nettoyage est une étape qui est longue, qui est fastidieuse, et on avait souvent des, des, des personnes en situation de handicap qui nous disaient voilà, que c'était assez pénible à faire. Et donc, il, il fallait qu'on trouve une solution. So, Pauline worked with an engineer to invent a machine that can reduce some of the labor. While Unisoap wouldn't show us exactly how this prototype works, it hopes to build more of them as it scales up. C'est marrant de voir en fait les savons qui sautent comme ça euh, et qui tombent euh, dans le seau. Commercial mixers grind and blend the differently sized bars into smaller, uniform pieces. The mixture finally enters an extruder that molds the soap into one long piece. Workers hand cut the individual bars and stamp Unisoap's logo into each one. Pain de savon euh, neuf, euh, euh, voilà, puisqu'on est, est soumis euh, aux mêmes euh, réglementations euh, cosmétiques qu'un fabricant classique. Since the company launched in 2017, workers have processed nearly 10 metric tons of soap this way. Over in the United States, the much larger Clean the World upgraded to an industrial assembly line years ago. The used soap comes from thousands of hotels around the world, adding up to about 1.4 million rooms. In 2009, CEO Sean Siepler started out shaving soap with vegetable peelers in a one-car garage. We would sit here and just scrape it off and make sure it was cleaned up and good to go. Today, a giant machine called a refiner cleans the dirt and hair from the top layers, pushing out uniform noodle-like strands from all the differently sized bars. Those strands get heated and mixed with a solution of water and bleach for seven to eight minutes to sanitize them. A conveyor belt brings the sterilized mix to a final refiner before it gets molded. A long bar of recycled soap rolls out from the extruder as it's cut into individual bars. 
clean the world ships soap overseas to countries like Ghana, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, where many people live without basic access to running water. More than 3 billion people around the world live this way, and over 700 children die every day from diarrheal diseases that might easily be prevented by washing with soap and water. We need a couple more. The company reports back to its hotel partners about how their donations help. So they know exactly how much landfill diversion they've had, how many bars of soap have gotten in the hands of children and mothers around the world because of their efforts. Since 2009, Clean the World has donated more than 73 million recycled bars to children in need. Even though UniSoap is still growing compared to Clean the World, it's already making an impact closer to home. Quand on voit qu'il y a 51 millions de savons d'un côté qui sont jetés par les hôtels en France et euh, qu'il y a 3 millions de personnes euh, qui n'ont pas les moyens de s'acheter des produits d'hygiène de base, ben, voilà, on a vite compris que la solution qu'on a euh, euh, est hyper importante. Pauline got her idea to recycle soap while staying at a hotel. Euh, lorsque j'ai demandé à l'hôtelier, mais euh, que faites-vous euh, de vos savonnettes une fois qu'elles ont été utilisées Et euh, il me disait qu'en fait, elles partaient toutes à la poubelle. So she started reaching out to hotels in 2017 about their used toiletries. Now they collect soap from nearly 350 locations. Getting the soap was the easy part. Figuring out how to recycle it took longer. Alors à partir du moment voilà, on a commencé à faire de la, de la recherche, développement sur le process, on a commencé euh, voilà, à se mettre dessus jusqu'au moment où on a formé les moniteurs, les travailleurs en situation de handicap, bah, on peut dire qu'il s'est pratiquement écoulé deux ans. Hein. That led Pauline to a government program that matches young people with disabilities to a variety of small companies. And she relies on volunteers to help distribute hygiene kits containing toothbrushes, toothpaste, and of course, recycled soap. Donc il y a deux ans, on a ouvert cet établissement qui s'appelle Le Phare pour euh, accueillir des familles en difficulté. Euh, L'idée ici, voilà, c'est ce lieu un peu, c'est un lieu repère pour ces, pour ces familles, pour qu'elles puissent euh, trouver un temps de chaleur. Hein. Marcel comes in a few times a week to meet with friends, mm. play games, and stay warm, as well as to use the only public showers in the area. Ah, oh, j'étais et vous soufflez par le cadeau. Unisoap has donated 30,000 of these bars across France to community centers just like this one. But the hotel industry may be shifting away from practices that allow these two companies to help people. In 2019, Marriott International and IHG, two of the world's largest hotel companies, announced they were stocking bathrooms with large refillable liquid dispensers. That's almost 2.4 million hotel rooms with no more bars in their showers. The companies estimate they'll eliminate over 2 million pounds of plastic heading for the landfill this way. Marriott told Insider it's even considering removing the small hand soap bars next to hotel sinks. But this trade-off isn't so simple. According to one study, washing with a bar uses less soap versus liquid cleaners, up to six times less. So bars go further than liquids and don't require plastic bottles to begin with. And those refillable soap containers, they nearly always take on more bacteria when staff refill them. Despite this, UniSoap and Clean the World continue to grow their soap recycling initiatives beyond their humble beginnings. Both started from a simple question. What happens to this soap after I check out? So the next time you're asked how a hotel can make your stay better, consider asking them what they do with your dirty soap. This massive pile of pine trees will be turned into cardboard packaging. A single box can contain material from thousands of trees and pass through the hands of hundreds of workers. They're like, it's just a box. And I say, no, it ain't. <laughs> a, lot, a lot goes into it. If you've used a cardboard box in the U.S. today, there's a one in three chance that international paper made it. It's the world's largest paper company. Cardboard is essential for countless industries, protecting items as they move on trucks and ships. And the good news is that it's one of the most recycled materials in the world. But if so much of it gets reused, why do we still have to cut down millions of trees? 
And is it possible to make environmentally friendly cardboard? This mill in Georgia is just one of hundreds of facilities operated by International Paper. It runs 24-7 to meet demand from online shopping, grocery stores, and more. But no one in this industry would call their product cardboard. Why don't you like to use the word cardboard? Because it's not cardboard. <laughs> Insiders call it corrugated packaging, a wavy layer sandwiched between two flat outer sheets. But yeah, most people call it cardboard. Making it starts with living trees. Forester Alex Singleton walked us through an area whose trees were sold to international paper two years ago. It has since been replanted with longleaf pine. But it will still take decades for the new crop to mature. For many foresters, we only see a site harvested once during our careers. From this stage to there would probably be around 30 years. After harvesting, landowners make money selling their trees to different industries, which makes them into things like lumber, telephone poles, and of course, paper. The idea is to turn forests into an investment so more people plant and maintain them. Without young, healthy forests, our industry could not be successful. I don't view logging or clear cutting as negative. It's just the start of a process. But critics say that replanting trees is not the same as letting them grow. This is one of the most industrial and heavily logged forests on the planet. The southern U.S., sometimes called America's wood basket, is home to 2% of the world's forested land. Yet it produces nearly 20% of our pulp and paper products which either means it's highly productive or highly exploited, depending on who you ask. On a typical day, about 300 trucks loaded with freshly cut trees drive up to this mill. The first stop is the wood yard. Some of the trees are set aside into these massive piles, which ensure the mill can sustain round-the-clock operations. They come from farms and forests within 120 miles. A sprinkler keeps them wet so they stay fresh and to reduce the risk of fire. A crane scoops trees from the pile and drops them into a machine that knocks off the bark. With a debarking drum, you're removing bark. You know, I tell kids similar to like a potato peeler. This process creates tons of leftover bark, which will be burned for energy. The debarked trunks travel through a chipper and pile up here. On that wood chip pile, we can keep up to around 100,000 tons of chips. It'll only take the mill about 10 days to work through this mountain. A conveyor belt feeds into the next step, pulping. Pine is made of long, stringy fibers held together by a natural glue-like material called lignin. Papermakers want the fibers, but not the glue. So they use steam and chemicals to dissolve it. The reaction can create gas that smells like sulfur. If you've ever noticed a rotten odor while driving by a paper plant, that's probably why. International Paper says its plants are built to capture a lot of those gases, which cuts down on smell. The fibers are covered in a toxic mix of chemicals and tree residue, so they have to be cleaned. That liquor that's washed off gets evaporated and consolidated and goes into what we call a recovery boiler. In other words, the plant burns those goopy leftovers, creating steam and chemicals that can go back through the process and save energy. We're really plants inside of a plant, so we have our own chemical plant, our own power plant. In fact, this mill makes about 75% of its own energy on site. IP is also burning less coal than it used to, which helps cut down on factory emissions. But trees hold a lot of carbon, and the company's own sustainability report says carbon released by processing the trees was more than double its emissions from burning fossil fuels in 2022. Before the pulp becomes paper, workers add used cardboard to the mix. Old packaging gets a new start in this warehouse. 
The boxes that we use here in the recycle plant come from local retailers and grocery stores up to a 300 mile radius from the mill. Katie Fries has worked in this recycling mill for three years. She says people still have a lot of misconceptions about the process. Our process is designed to take out the stuff like grease and tape. Just recycle any corrugated box you have, whether it has tape on it or food in it, it can be used to make paper again. Then you can recycle a pizza box. Every day, this mill recycles 500 tons of used cardboard. Each ton saves trees, energy, and water. Saving water is key because nearly every step of papermaking uses lots of it. The used cardboard also gets pulped. Using water and chemicals, then mixes with fresh fibers. Workers simply call this massive contraption the paper machine. It presses the pulp flat and squeezes out water. Then it sends the mixture through a series of dryers heated to over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. As it goes down the machine, the sheet gets drier and drier. And after all that, you still only have paper. To become corrugated packaging, the rolls head to a box plant, like this one in Illinois. Here, flexible paper becomes sturdy boxes. The heartbeat of the plant is the corrugator. Corrugating is how the packaging's middle layer gets that distinctive wavy shape. The waves are actually called flutes, and they're what gives this type of packaging its strength. There are different types of flutes. Smaller ones print better, aren't as good for stacking strength, and the larger ones don't print as well, but they're better for stacking strength. This plant can make boxes in over 1.6 million different designs. The smallest box I've ever made was about the size of a ring box. The largest box I've ever made in one of my facilities was for a washing machine. After gluing the layers together, Finishing touches include printing on graphics and cutting the sheets into their final shapes. To save space, most boxes ship to customers flat, and any trimmings or waste pieces can be recycled right back into the process. In the US, more than 70% of used cardboard gets recycled, which is much higher than the rates for aluminum, glass, or plastic. Corrugating paper is uh, easy to recycle because the supply chain supports it, so there's value in it. It also helps that nearly 80% of Americans can recycle it using bins right on their curbs. So why does the industry still use up so many trees? Part of it is that old cardboard can't be recycled indefinitely. The EPA says it can only go through the process about seven times. Each time it goes through pulping and blending, the long, strong pine fibers get a bit shorter and weaker. And eventually, the degraded paper bits simply wash through the screens and out of the process. So recycling is very important. But even if 100% of boxes got reused, making new ones would still mean cutting down trees. Some experts say the big question is whether the industry manages forests responsibly. International paper gets more than 90% of its fiber from trees in the southern US where the vast majority of woodlands are on private property. What we do is we provide a viable market for that landowner's trees such that they will have the income or revenue to be able to pay for the reforestation that takes place on their lands. Foresters and paper companies argue that without that market, people might just sell their land, potentially losing forests forever to agriculture, parking lots, or other uses. Data from the University of Maryland shows that tree cover in the U.S. today is about the same as it was in the year 2000. For me, as a forester, it must mean that we're doing our job right, you know, that we're taking care of the environment, that we're promoting forest growth. But measuring forest area is complicated. To start, not everyone agrees what a forest even is. Pine plantations are not forests. Those are tree farms that lack the diversity, the structural diversity, the biological diversity that a lot of these species depend on. An environmental nonprofit called the Dogwood Alliance says that tree farms have been replacing natural forests. That could potentially have a global impact. Some experts estimate that natural forests are 40 times better than plantations at storing carbon which makes them crucial to slowing climate change. Forests have lots of other benefits too, like filtering our drinking water and reducing erosion. 
Certain forestry techniques, like leaving some large trees in place, can help planted forests retain those benefits. I think there are ways to sustainably manage forests without taking out the, the larger trees and completely destroying the structural complexity of a forest. But that takes really skilled, targeted forestry. And that's not always what happens. Ultimately, the world uses a lot of paper, which has to come from somewhere. You might see certifications stamped on boxes. Those are supposed to indicate they're made of trees that were harvested sustainably. International Paper says that more than 30% of the fibers it used in 2022 came from forests with one of those certifications. I think there is a way for industry and conservation to coexist in southern forests, but there has to be a good faith effort on all sides. This goo can be made into a plastic-like film that can cover all kinds of food and you can eat it. The process that makes this possible takes place in a high-tech lab. But the raw materials come from seaweed farms. Companies around the world are racing to find eco-friendly versions of the thinnest packaging. It's the stuff that makes up about half of all plastics in our oceans. Neha Jane says she's invented a product that could replace it. We make clear thin films, which we call the good plastic, uh, or uh, the kind of form of plastic. Farming seaweed requires no fertilizers, fresh water, or land. Neha and her team say their product is non-toxic and completely dissolves in liquid within hours. They call the company Zero Circle, a nod toward reducing emissions and waste to zero. And right now, this startup is competing against seven other plastic alternative companies for a $1.2 million prize. We traveled to India to see how seaweed can replace plastic food wrappers. While extracting this new material requires state-of-the-art gear, farming the seaweed used to make it uses only the simplest tools. Dilip Kumar owns this seaweed farm and supplies Zero Circle with its raw materials. And this stuff grows fast. So we harvest every 45 days once from the date of seeding. Dilip hires locals like Karupia to build bamboo rafts. At one time, fishing dominated this area. But in recent years, more locals have been making a living farming seaweed. They're working in the same waters where they used to fish earlier and now they're able to cultivate. And with over 4,500 miles of coastline, India has quite a bit of space to grow it. Seedlings get attached to ropes on each raft, and each knot holds one seedling. Lakshmi has been farming seaweed for 18 years, and she says locals' perception of this business has changed quite a bit. <laughs> Every part of this operation is done by hand, including hauling full rafts in for harvest. Workers cut the seaweed, but leave some segments to regrow. Then, the seaweed dries in the sun. After about 36 hours, Lakshmi removes dried salt, seagrass, and other contaminants. The dried seaweed lays out in the sun for a few more days before heading to Zero Circle's labs. For these farmers, seaweed provides a livelihood, but it's not always easy. You don't know what comes in the ocean for you today. It's like a uh, surprise box every day and you keep solving the puzzle every day. They do what they can to protect their crop from wind, waves, and hungry fish. Commercial seaweed farming around the world has increased a thousand fold since 1950. But experts warn that large and rapid increases in seaweed farming could have unintended consequences. Rafts of seaweed can block light 
and change the way water flows to the ecosystem below. And if farming operations are not managed properly, it can be devastating. In 2013, a bacteria decimated the seaweed industry in the Philippines. Studies show the disease spread easily among rafts that were placed too close together. Here at Zero Circle's lab in Pune, seaweed transforms into plastic alternatives. First, the dried seaweed goes through several washing and milling steps. Notice how free-flowing this is. Clean water washes impurities away. The washed seaweed then goes into a reactor to be heated. The carbohydrates inside seaweed are what's needed to make plastic-like material. This material is extremely gel-like and viscous. Technicians add solvents. It's strained, and then we get this. You can see the gel start to clump together in the beaker. The next stop is this device, called a rotary evaporator. It removes solvents until it's refined into a more free-flowing gel. Then, it's put into a cast to mold and dry. So if you notice, this forms a nice thick gel. It can be removed from the plate in a few minutes. And when stretched thinner, the seaweed mix comes out looking like the familiar film companies use to package food. Zero Circle's film can be sealed with heat, just like plastic wrap. But unlike conventional plastic, it dissolves in water. In boiling water, it's a matter of moments. In seawater, the team says the film would be gone within two to four hours. And it takes up to four months in a compost pile. Zero Circle designed a product compatible with existing machinery, meaning that manufacturers wouldn't need new equipment to make the plastic-free film. These pellets are then put into a manufacturing line, which come out as clear thin films. We're not disrupting it, but we're sort of uh, retrofitting our product into it. And the company plans to begin selling pellets by 2024. The idea is that manufacturers could make edible, biodegradable forms of many products, like dissolvable soup and tea bag packets, wrappers for burgers, gift wraps, fashion packaging, and good old grocery store bags. They have very, very good capacity. They can hold up to five to eight kilograms in a, uh, in a single shopping bag. While these plastic alternatives offer great environmental benefits, traditional plastic film made from oil is still cheaper. We are trying to solve two big problems. One is make a fantastic material and make the material at a cost that people are able to use it. So Zero Circle claims to have an eco-friendly plastic alternative that it wants to scale up, but it's not alone. The company is one of eight finalists for the Tom Ford Plastic Innovation Prize. The fashion designer partnered with Lonely Whale, a nonprofit that played a huge role in the movement to eliminate plastic drinking straws. They're offering $1.2 million to find alternatives for thin plastic films. I was ecstatic. Uh, we almost missed the deadline because we did not know about it. Four of the finalists this year employ seaweed alternatives. The seaweed community is uh, not very competitive. They're very friendly with each other, and we're all friends. We talk about the same problem. Judges took over a year to make sure the winning company's solution is more than just marketing. Scientists ran each product through a battery of experiments. Samples sat in ocean water for months in the same That's conditions giant. conventional That's ocean plastic would. So much junk on it! Yeah. Okay. Other trials assessed how the plastic alternatives might affect wildlife. The finalists and the controls are going to sit in a simulated well deck for 24 hours. When Insider published this video, the winner of the Tom Ford Prize had not been announced. We'll add a link in the description to the winning companies. I think it's probably one of the longest running challenges that we've been part of, uh, but they're doing this right, and I think that's what makes it special. Neha was inspired in part by her own consumption. I always uh, had that guilt uh, that I think every millennial has about uh, the amount of pollution that we are creating on a daily basis. 
So, Zero Circle is not only looking at plastic films, but the things we may not think about much. Brands that are switching to paper are still uh, attaching plastic linings, glues, coatings. But Neha and Zero Circle are working to switch even those parts out with seaweed. This is first time we have developed the seaweed-based glue. This is formaldehyde free and volatile organic compound free. It works on cardboard, paper, and wood with quite a bit of strength. So Zero Circle's future could be growing as fast as seaweed. And there was an ocean of opportunity that nobody was looking at, uh, which I felt like for a country like India, it's unfathomable why people would not look at that opportunity. About half of every pineapple you eat ends up in the trash. The skin and core can be composted, but in many places, they aren't. One company turns fruit scraps into natural soap and cleaners. The founder, Le Dui Huang, says they're safer for the planet and people. So safe, he drinks the stuff every day. <laughs> Fermented fruit is part of a new trend. Cleaning with enzymes instead of harsh chemicals. Does it actually work? Throughout history, people have used all sorts of stuff to wash up. Everything from animal fat to human urine. In the early 20th century, scientists figured out how to make suds in a lab using fossil fuels. That paved the way for all kinds of synthetic gels, powders, and cleaning chemicals, which are all detergents. So much whiter, she can actually see the difference instantly. The problem is, they were full of stuff that water treatment plants weren't built to clean out, like phosphorus and nitrogen. When those elements flood waterways, they can make algae grow faster, creating thick layers of muck that suffocate life below. That's exactly what happened in North America in the 1960s. Lake Erie is almost biologically dead. Today, detergent pollution has spread around the world, foaming up rivers and fueling overgrown algae. Fuwa Biotech is betting that fruit cleaners are the next chapter for cleaning products. The name Fuwa comes from the phrase fruit warrior. The company buys fruit waste from a factory that makes canned pineapple. Workers here chop thousands of them every day. This pile is from just a half day's work. These used to rot in nearby landfills, creating bad smells and methane, a powerful planet warming gas. Now, workers load the scraps onto a truck and travel about two miles to the production site. Here, the team unloads the fruit skins and washes them. Next, they mix together the first ingredients, sugar and water. Fuwa uses about two metric tons of sugar every month. Workers add the pineapple peels to the sugar water and wait for the mixture to start to ferment. Fermentation is when microbes, like bacteria or yeast, break down complex molecules like sugar into simpler stuff like alcohol. It's how barley becomes beer and grapes become wine. At Fuwa, fermentation is how waste becomes cleaning fluids. But the secret isn't alcohol. It's the enzymes and acids the pineapples will release. Enzymes are molecules that speed up chemical reactions, like digestion in the human body. Certain enzymes can fight germs by entering cells and breaking them apart from the inside. This can either kill bacteria or just slow them down enough that they probably won't make you sick. But to make those germ-stopping enzymes from plants, you have to ferment the right mix of ingredients for just the right amount of time. Workers here stir the mixture every day. After about a month, it looks like this. Các cái vỏ dứa sẽ mềm hơn. 
Mọi người thấy bắt đầu nó bị tơi ra rồi Và đã có bắt đầu có mùi thơm rồi Rất là chua By two months, this glob of bacteria and microorganisms forms. That's how you know it's working. The founders don't keep any of their process a secret. Dứa này thì uh, 10 phần nước này, 10 phần nước, 1 phần uh, đường và 3 phần dứa. Huang says he learned this technique from Rotsokon Pumponbong. She's a scientist and Buddhist nun who figured out the formula, then shared it freely for others to use. After the mixture ferments for three months, there's enough acid and enzymes for it to work as a cleaner. Now it's ready to be filtered. Thì chúng tôi đã lọc lọc trong lọc trong để lấy cái enzyme trong trong nhất và bơm lên cái 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 các cái tép chứa như này. The leftover solids become fertilizer for nearby farms, and the remaining liquid is the base for everything Fuwa makes. Kết hợp cùng một vài cái phụ gia an toàn từ dầu dừa, dầu ngô từ tinh dầu, từ tất các tinh dầu bản địa Việt Nam để tạo thành các chất tẩy rửa. Fuwa buys those oils from local farmers, who make them using agricultural waste like stems and leaves. The final mixture is bottled and shipped to mini marts around Vietnam, or to online customers in most countries. One bottle of dish soap sells for just over two dollars. Huang says that's less than the cost of similar imported products. Fuwa uses an on-site lab to test its products, and it looks at competitor stuff as well, measuring the pH and testing for other additives. Cleaning with fermented fruit is a fairly new concept, but there's evidence it has a lot of potential. Researchers compared a pineapple enzyme mixture to bleach in water and found it killed one type of bacteria equally well. And early research suggests fruit enzymes might even make wastewater cleaner. We know more about common chemical cleaners like bleach. They kill lots of germs, but come with other risks. Huang started making fruit cleaners when his wife, now the company's CEO, developed eczema. Vợ tôi bị viêm da cơ địa, tức là da bị nứt nẻ rồi chảy máu vào mùa đông. Và tôi cũng thấy cái phát hiện ra đó là cái cái vì cái 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 nguyên nhân của cái cái việc của bệnh tình của vợ tôi ấy, là do sử dụng cái một phần nguyên nhân là do sử dụng cái các chất tẩy rửa công nghiệp. Studies have linked cleaning products to skin irritation and breathing problems, including asthma. When used and stored properly, they're safe for most people, but mixing bleach with the wrong cleaners can create deadly gas, which happens thousands of times per year in the United States. So, could we one day replace household bleach and detergents with fermented pineapples? We asked an expert. You'll be surprised, yes, <laughs> totally yes. But he also said we need more research. There's only a certain number of bacteria that it has been tested, so probably got to do a wide range of studies with a wide range of microorganisms to ensure that it's really effective. Enzyme cleaners pose another challenge, shelf life will be one of the major issues. With certain temperature, it might be inactivated. Fuwa says its products can last about two years, which is about as long as most chemical cleaning sprays. Still, Fuwa has more work to do. With so much pineapple processing in the region, the company says it has lots of waste to work with. Và có thể scale lên gấp 5, gấp 10 lần bây giờ, mà không, không gặp nhiều vấn đề về nguyên liệu. But mainly, the founders want people to know there's a gentler alternative. Không chỉ là một cái sản phẩm của Fuwa mà chúng tôi muốn là người dùng biết được cái tác dụng ecoenzyme. So, they're eager to spread the word. Sứ mệnh của mình đó là giúp người dân trên toàn cầu bớt đi một nỗi lo trong cuộc sống hàng ngày. Đó chính là nỗi lo các hóa chất độc hại trong gia đình của các bạn. We make over 1 billion pairs of jeans every year, and most of them wind up in landfills. That's partially because cotton is notoriously hard to recycle. The process is lengthy and expensive. But some in the fashion industry want to make a greener pair of blue jeans. Artistic Fabric Mills, AFM for short, 
is one of the first companies in Pakistan to repurpose old cotton into new denim. And that's a big deal because this country imports more used clothes than anywhere else in the world. So how do you recycle jeans? It starts at massive facilities like this one in Karachi, where workers sort 25 metric tons of used clothes every day. Most of these items were donated to charities like the Salvation Army in other countries. Oftentimes, whatever can't be sold in American and European thrift stores can be sold to grading centers in Pakistan. Purses, sweaters, pants, and more get separated into hundreds of categories. Items are bundled based on quality and type. Then they're shipped to places like this huge secondhand market in Ghana. Here, local vendors bid on bales, then try to sell their wares for a profit. Back in Pakistan, the lowest grade garments are sold for cheap to recyclers, typically to be shredded and used in things like insulation. And where most see rags, AFM sees riches. It buys used jeans from this local grading company. Clothes which are like too dirty or not good for wearing, we give it to like the companies like Artistic for recycling. At AFM, workers cut down the garments. The company can't process stretch jeans mixed with polyester or nylon. So it only accepts denim that is at least 98% cotton. It takes around three pairs of used jeans to make one pair of recycled pants. A quick pass through this conveyor belt cuts these long strips of fabric into small pieces. Each step aims to grind the pants back into cotton. This compactor presses the cotton into large bales. The company says these machines can process up to 800 metric tons of used clothes every month. But the recycled fibers are too short to be spun into yarn. So the company has to add virgin cotton into the mix. When AFM first bought a cotton recycling plant in 2015, it could only incorporate 5% recycled material into its blend. Nowadays, it can mix in as much as 30% used cotton. This machine, called a Blendomat, skims off the top layer of fiber from multiple bales to ensure consistency. This particular batch of denim will use 8% recycled material and 92% virgin cotton. In the spinning room, a carding machine draws the blended cotton into a web, then stretches it into thick ropes called slivers. The ring spinning process turns rope into yarn. Though largely automated now, this method is based on ancient yarn spinning techniques. The fiber is twisted tightly and then wrapped around a spool called a bobbin. Workers place larger spools on a metal rack called a creel. Then they wind the threads around a beam. One of these can hold over 4,000 strands of yarn side by side. Now it's time for a bath. AFM dyes its fabric with recycled indigo eliminating wastewater from the dyeing process entirely. We are making this fabric by extracting the indigo from our dyed textile waste and then reusing it to dye a new fabric. The strips appear green at first because indigo dye is not water soluble. The threads will only turn blue when they come into contact with oxygen. That's why the ropes are brought high up into the air. The process is called skying. These rollers press out the excess water, then each rope lands in its own bucket. In the rope dyeing department, production is around 70,000 meters per day. Typically, the indigo dyeing process is associated with massive water consumption and pollution. Although laws prohibit it, some Pakistani factories pump untreated water into sewers, city canals, rivers, and groundwater, contaminating already scarce supplies. 
अक्सर बच्चों में बीमारियाँ बड़ों में सांस की बीमारियाँ और अक्सर अकात बच्चे जो होते हैं ना वो नाले में गिर जाते हैं लोगों का नुकसान होता है Many factories lack the space or resources to treat their water. But AFM says it purifies around 300,000 gallons of wastewater in a giant treatment plant every day. Up to 70% of this water is used in its recycling process. Back at the factory, an automated loom mixes dyed thread with white thread, typically in a ratio of 3 to 1. This gives jeans their signature twill pattern. The fabric wraps around giant wheels, then gets layered into sheets. In total, AFM produces 36 million meters of fabric a year. That's nearly enough to circle the entire planet. The finished cloth gets cut into various sizes and styles. Using cutting edge software, lasers etch patterns into the jeans. This technology eliminates the need for toxic chemicals, often used to create a stressed vintage look. AFM uses less water in its finishing process as a result. Saving water is crucial in Pakistan. Much of the country relies on the Indus River for irrigation and hydropower. But extreme droughts mean parts of it are already drying up. It takes 10,000 liters of water to make a single pair of jeans. So cutting back on water consumption can have a huge impact. Eco-friendly washers give the jeans a more distressed look. The sustainable wash means less energy, less water, less chemical. This is the big impact for the sustainability factor, what we are doing right now. Then, a blower dries the jeans while they hang in the air. Think of it like a car wash for pants. Workers add the finishing touches from buttons to labels. From there, they're off to stores across Europe, North America, and Australia. Once used jeans get a second shelf life. While it may look like AFM has its process down to a science, it wasn't always that way. The now multi-million dollar company started as a small garment shop in 1949. Ahmed Omer and his wife Hadra Ahmed sold handmade leather hats and bags to sailors out of their home. In 1972, they opened their first garment factory. Today, it's run by their son, Iqbal Ahmed. Hadra's role in the company would later inspire her granddaughters, Farah and Haya Iqbal, to follow in her footsteps. The two sisters are now directors for AFM. My grandmother would actually manage the operations at that time. And then it grew into factories. When women apply to AFM for jobs, not just on a worker level, but for management roles, they do it because they know that it's a possibility here. AFM has also been ahead of the curve when it comes to manufacturing sustainable denim. In 2015, it became one of the first companies in Pakistan to own this, a cotton recycling plant. From there, producing recycled denim became priority number one. AFM isn't alone in its mission to recycle textiles. Other factories in Pakistan are investing in cotton recycling as well. It's become a real need, and it's not just something that looks good on your portfolio, but it's something that is now required. Even big-name companies like H&M have invested millions in new recycling technology. At the company's store in Stockholm, customers pay to have old clothes transformed into new ones. But recycling a single garment can take multiple days. H&M wants to move to 100% recycled or sustainably sourced materials by 2030. But scaling up recycled production is expensive. AFM has a decades-long head start. The cost of its factories, though massive, were spread out over many years. At the time, nobody was doing it. No customers even understood why it was a necessity. But it was my father's vision that he stuck his ground and he made this massive investment because he could tell where the world was heading. AFM says it has the capacity to create half a million pairs of jeans every month, but its actual production is around 300,000. For recycled jeans to become a large-scale success, more companies need to get involved. Right now, 
Less than 1% of all clothes are turned into recycled garments. An even simpler solution is to buy less. I firmly believe that consuming less but of better quality is the way forward. And that's because this is not to discourage people from buying more, but if they buy better and they buy better quality, once somebody is done with a garment, that can always be resold secondhand or donated. It just increases the life of a garment if you buy better quality. In 2012, a teenager came up with an ambitious plan to eliminate plastic in the ocean. Boy and Slat wanted to harness natural currents to collect floating debris inside a giant U-shaped barrier. I believe the Great Pacific Garbage Patch can completely clean itself in just five years. That timeline didn't work out. And there's still a garbage truck's worth of plastic entering the ocean every minute on average. But the ocean cleanup has made progress. The nonprofit has removed more than 200 metric tons of trash from the Pacific. Many people said that it could, couldn't be done, that it was a fool's errand, a pipe dream. But to really make a dent in plastic pollution, the organization's going closer to the source. Most ocean plastic comes from rivers. So the Dutch entrepreneur invented these big machines that capture waste before it ever makes it to open waters. Rivers are the, the arteries that carry the trash from land to sea. They're called interceptors, and the founder plans to deploy a thousand of them. But some experts worry these machines could strip rivers and oceans of things that are supposed to be there, too. So, can a network of trash barriers clean the world's most polluted rivers? And are cleaner rivers the key to a plastic-free ocean? The Rio Osama in the Dominican Republic flows into the Caribbean Sea. It's one of the dirtiest rivers in the world. And Carmen Encarnacion has lived nearby for 24 years. The ocean cleanup installed an interceptor about a mile down the river from her home in 2020. The idea is to let the current do most of the work. As trash travels downstream, this 700-foot-long arm redirects it toward the machine's opening. So what the barriers do is they let the water pass, but they stop everything that's floating. On the roof, we have these solar panels that are connected to batteries, which store the energy so that even at night we can keep intercepting plastic. Conveyor belts carry the waste to one of six dumpsters. They can fill up in just three days during the rainy season. A lot of today's haul is plants. And in this case, that's probably not a bad thing. These are invasive water hyacinths. They grow naturally in the Amazon, but over the past century, humans have introduced them to new places where they don't have any predators. Like the Osama River, where they're taking over, blocking light and oxygen, and killing plants and animals beneath them. The plant tends to thrive in polluted water, and its roots cling to trash. Nearby factories and farms have used this river as a dumping ground for decades. But in Santo Domingo, many people who live on the Osama's banks depend on it for drinking water. A lot of them also have limited options for dealing with waste. It has to do with urban planning, and if these communities here don't have the, the access roads for the trucks to come in. So some locals dump their trash in drainage ditches called cañadas. So right behind me, we have the Cañada Bonavides. It's one of the worst cañadas we have here in the Osama River. Just like the rivers are the arteries that take the plastic to the ocean, these cañadas here are the arteries that take the plastic to the river. The ocean cleanup estimates the Osama carries up to 22,000 metric tons of plastic into the Caribbean Sea each year. The nonprofit has 10 other interceptors in rivers around the globe. The devices can't remove all types of pollution, like chemicals or plastic that doesn't float. And until residents have more options for dealing with trash, it'll keep ending up in the Osama. We rely heavily on, on working with local partners, such as the Dominican Navy here or the UNDP, precisely to work on this upstream problem. The Navy handles day-to-day -day operations for the river cleaner. 
and it works with the national government to manually collect trash that slips by the interceptor. They have proven to be the perfect partners for us. By the end of the year, they should be owning the interceptor. Once that happens, the ocean cleanup will shift its focus to other rivers, like the Rio Motagua in Guatemala, which the nonprofit says might have more plastic than any other in the world. In Guatemala, uh, there's so much trash coming down the river that these machines would be filled within a few seconds. So there, again, we have a different type of interceptor. The nonprofit built an interceptor fence to catch plastic in a flash flood zone that flows into the river. Every river is unique. You really need to adapt it to the specific circumstances of that river. The fence lets some plastics through, but Boyne expects to have an updated interceptor by the end of 2023. Meanwhile, the founder hasn't given up on his initial dream, cleaning the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. He founded the Ocean Cleanup in 2013, and a decade later, the patch is still growing. One challenge is that it isn't really a patch. It's actually two swirling clouds of debris, which often aren't visible on the surface. Natural currents have created five whirlpools like it around the world, called gyres, and each one collects trash. The nonprofit is working on cleaning up the North Pacific gyre using this thing. It's a flexible barrier stretched between two ships with a shallow screen hanging off. The idea is to consolidate floating plastic, making it easier to collect about once a week. The Ocean Cleanup says in total, it's removed more than 200 metric tons of plastic from the Pacific Gyre. Yet it's only about two tenths of a percent of all the plastic that might be floating here. The team is working on a system three times bigger than this one, which should be ready sometime in 2023. Some researchers worry these cleaning machines can disrupt ecosystems by scooping up living things along with trash. The Ocean Cleanup says the screen creates a downward flow that carries living creatures under it. But the system still catches some fish, crabs, barnacles, and other animals. The nonprofit says it's continually fine-tuning the device to try to keep creatures out, but it's impossible to avoid them completely. That's partially because sea life is all mixed up with the plastic and can even live right on it. Sea urchins, uh, sea stars, Pretty much anything that you can imagine, you can also find on these uh, plastic floats. And there's a lot of organisms that also attach their eggs to these floating plastics. Some critics say the whole idea of passively harvesting plastic is risky. Once it is in the ocean, it is connected with marine life. It's too late to remove it. A potential alternative is targeting clusters of trash instead of sweeping the whole gyre. Plastic in the open ocean tends to form these plastic dust bunnies at sea. Collecting the plastic debris is also pretty easy once it's plumped into these dust bunnies because then you have a single targeted area with an extremely high amount of plastic. Those clumps are mostly fishing gear, which does the most damage. By focusing on things like ghost gear, which are really, really dangerous to marine life, you're collecting the most harmful plastic out of the ocean, not necessarily collecting some of the less harmful plastic, things like laundry baskets or buckets, which may have a lot of life growing on them. The Ocean Cleanup says that in the long run, its ocean systems will be more scalable than manual cleaning. When it comes to its river cleanup, experts were more optimistic. I loved it I, in the diagrams, how it sort of funnels it in. I was like, that is so perfect. Once it's in the ocean, it's a problem that, that really becomes much harder to manage. That tracks with Boyan's results. As of April 2023, his team has collected more than 10 times as much plastic from rivers as from the ocean. In Santo Domingo, members of the Dominican Navy empty the dumpsters and send the haul to the Duquesa landfill. Of course, landfill is not ideal, but at least it's a million times better than it flowing into the ocean. Boyan says the river plastics can't be recycled as easily as the ones from the ocean. It's much more of a mix, and also it's much more polluted. So you have sewage water that's often in these rivers. Ultimately, restoring a polluted ecosystem requires big changes. The best way to keep plastic out of rivers and oceans is to make less of it. Everybody can do something, but we also need the companies to do their part. This needs to be a collaboration between all sectors of society. 
In the meantime, Carmen does what she can to clean up her own neighborhood. In her free time, she collects water hyacinths and transforms them into art. La teníamos ahí mismo y no sabíamos qué hacer con ella. Y eso me motivó a ir desenvolviendo, a ver la curiosidad de qué tipo de cosas se podían hacer con ella. She dries the plant and weaves it into hats, bags, and more. Hay muchos tipos de decoraciones y ahí podemos portar con lo que es eliminando la contaminación. Much like plastic, the plant can be useful, but Carmen still wants to see it gone. O sea, si la humanidad no se une y coopera con lo que es el reciclaje, eh, va a seguir lo que es la contaminación. These bricks are made from seaweed. The secret is sargassum, an invasive species washing up and rotting on beaches around North America. The massive waves can lead to respiratory problems and can cost millions to clean up. But where most people see a problem, Omar Vasquez saw potential. He turns the seaweed into bricks strong enough to build homes that he says can withstand hurricanes. Lo primero que pensé fue empezar a donar casas, ya que mi madre, mis hermanos y yo nunca tuvimos un techo propio. Omar and his family immigrated to the U.S. with nothing in their pockets when he was just eight years old. Now, he uses his bricks to build homes for low-income families, like the Lopez's. Pues tenemos cada una nuestro cuarto. Y es algo bonito porque siempre desde chiquitas lo habíamos soñado. Could this invention help other countries clean up their coastlines? We went to Mexico to see how entrepreneurs like Omar are making the most out of a stinky situation. Omar and his team start collecting the seaweed at 5 a.m. Today, they're in Puerto Morelos, a small beach town about 25 miles from Cancun. Cuando llega todo el sargazo, lo primero que hizo la gente fue quejarse. Que huele mal, apesta, uh, tiene pulga, tiene todo. Hotels pay them to get the seaweed off the beach and out of the view of tourists. They collect about 40 metric tons of sargassum every day, enough to fill two of these containers. En una noche se acumula todo eso. Hay que darle muy duro a la chamba para poder acabar con el sargazo. Se está incrementando más. The idea to turn seaweed into bricks came to Omar in 2018, when more than 50,000 metric tons of sargassum overran the coast. Al principio fue hacerlo de manera manual y artesanal, como se hacía el adobe. La impresión de ellos es es no creer. Es como que cómo puede ser. Omar makes the bricks, which he calls sarga blocks, at his workshop, 10 minutes from the beach. Workers grind the dry sargassum into a fine powder by smashing it with rocks. Then they mix it with dirt, which Omar repurposes from construction sites. They shovel a mixture of sargassum dust and dirt through a grate to remove any large chunks. They mix the powder with water to form a thick paste. The exact recipe is a secret, but each brick is about 40% sargassum. Sargo blocks can also be recycled again and again. Se te rompe, lo vuelves a moler y lo vuelves a fabricar. With this single machine, Omar can make up to 3,000 bricks a day. He developed eight prototypes before perfecting this one. Now, he's designing a bigger machine that could produce 8,000 bricks a day. He has six full-time employees making the bricks, and some help build homes, too. So sí, es difícil, pero pues ahora sí que Hemos visto la cara de las personas cuando se han donado luego casas o cosas así y te llena, ¿no? Esa parte, este, se te olvida lo, lo otro. Since 2018, Omar has built more than 40 homes. The first one is right next to his workshop. He named it after his mother. Aquí estamos en Casa Angelita, la primera casa en el mundo hecha a base de sargazo. When he was eight years old, Omar left behind a home just like this one to cross the Mexico-US border with his mother. Esta casa me recuerda mucho mi infancia, mi niñez, ya que es una réplica de la casa de mis abuelos. En este lado era una cocinita, me acuerdo perfectamente, una sala comedor que se me decía enorme y un baño. They wouldn't have a home of their own for the 30 years they lived in the US. El sueño americano es un sueño muy doloroso. Fue una vida complicada al, al vivir con una madre soltera, al, al no tener papá, al no tener un techo propio. Uh, caer el tema de las adicciones, del alcohol, de la droga. 
pero bueno, siempre tuve en mi mente y en mi corazón regresar a México. He finally returned to his home country for good in 2014 with just $55 in his pocket. He used it to start a business buying and selling plants. And he eventually saved enough money to buy this lot. Puedes que estando aquí, estoy en mi casa, no tengo miedo a nada. Developing Saga Blocks required a lot of trial and error. Pues mira, tengo en la mano el primer molde que utilizamos para los primeros adobes de, de sargazo. Omar's business is called Vivero Blue Green. He makes most of his money selling plants and from hotels paying him to clean up the sargassum. He also sells his bricks and builds houses. He has sold more than 20 homes and given away another 15. Omar admits the houses may not be fancy, but they are durable. Casa Angelita lleva cuatro años. Y la pueden ver, hemos tenido huracanes, tormentas tropicales, hasta la intemperie, y no ha pasado absolutamente nada. That's good news for Elizabeth del Carmen Bonola Lopez and her daughters. Their home was destroyed in a hurricane in 2021. Omar helped them rebuild it with Saga Blocks. Una palapa que se me estaba cayendo, que no tenía yo nada. Pues una casa de Saga Block, que nos sentimos seguras. Mis hijas y yo contentas, felices. No huele mal, no trae bichitos. Pues es más cómoda que cualquier casa, porque se ajusta al calor y al frío. Indeed, research shows that seaweed is a great insulator that keeps homes cool in the summer and stores heat in the winter. Usually, Omar hears about people in need through a friend or a local. Ah, pero ver la cara de las familias felices, híjole, eso sí no tiene precio. And there's no lack of raw material. Over the past decade, waves of sargassum have gotten so large you can detect them from space. In 2020, the Mexican government collected 19,000 metric tons of sargassum from Quintana Roo's beaches. In 2021, it collected twice that amount. Antes eran tres meses por año que se empezó a ver el sargazo, cuatro meses, y ahorita hemos visto temporadas que hasta nueve meses nos ha llegado al alga. Studies show prolonged exposure can make it hard to breathe. In 2023, the Cancun Hotel Association set aside more than $20 million to remove it from beaches. And the problem goes beyond Mexico. The invasive weed has spread to shores across North America, in Florida, Texas, and other parts of the Caribbean. The exact cause of the increase isn't clear, but some experts blame high levels of nitrogen in the sea, a result of agricultural waste runoff and deforestation. So now, Omar's business is getting international attention. He's given TED Talks, appeared on Shark Tank Mexico, and traveled internationally to promote his product. Investors and businesses from over a dozen countries have reached out to learn from him. Omar is exploring licensing and franchising the Sarka Block recipe to other businesses. Elsewhere in Mexico, other entrepreneurs are experimenting with new ways to use sargassum, like making notebooks and even shoes. A British startup called Seaweed Generation is using sargassum to capture carbon and store it at the bottom of the ocean. Back in Mexico, Omar is simply grateful to be living in his home country, surrounded by the people he loves. And after work, he returns to a home he built himself using his own bricks. Omar hopes his success will inspire others. Así es que los mexicanos volteemos a ver hacia nuestro país. Que volteemos a ver que también hay oportunidades. Si yo puedo, ustedes pueden hacerlo. Aaron Fletcher has been preparing for the end of the world for 15 years. He chose to be homeless in his early 20s. Now, he lives in this wagon. The whole thing is custom built to my body, to the, to the very quarter inch of how tall this is. And survives off sheep's milk. Every 400 years, um, societies collapse. Oh, that's good. And we're overdue. <laughs> I spent three days with Aaron in rural Oregon, documenting his attempt to live completely off-grid. Yeah. Fresh sheep milk uh, latte. Very creamy. Aaron says his sustainable solutions could help millions. And my entire life is, is a constant, ongoing experiment. But is this way of life healthy? Or has Aaron taken prepping too far? Good sheep. 
people walk, walk their dogs through here all the time and stuff. Mostly everything Aaron owns fits inside the cart he designed himself. Yeah, bicycle wheels. It's his bedroom. Mm, cover up. <laughs> his kitchen and his bathroom. Literally sit right here and just poop into it. And then what do you do with the bag? And then throw it away. In a garbage can? Yeah. Good sheep. You hear her grunting? That, that's her like a pig, like, like she's really happy right now. Most of his diet comes from JC, happy. She's like a rebellious teenager. Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. And the animal that pulls his cart. Rabbit man, yeah. He knows his name. He's just a big love bug. Half gallon of, uh, of sheep milk uh, provides 2,100 calories. So each sheep can feed three people. He also turns their wool into clothing using just his hands and a cardboard box to shape the felt. One sheep fleece is enough to make a full hoodie. And that hoodie is gonna be thick and it'll last like five years at least. Um, the very smallest scraps that I have, I use to make patches and to make uh, toilet paper. Sometimes Aaron hunts wild animals like raccoons. He cooks on this solar camping oven he bought online and their combination between a thermos and a greenhouse. Then I guess I'm going to be eating uh, raccoon for uh, the next week. I've eaten fox, raccoon, and coyote. I hear possum is really good. Today, he's making ground lamb seasoned with foraged plants. This is mugwort from uh, right down the road, and this is a uh, purslane. The meat was a gift from a local farmer and he tops it all off with cheese aged on his wagon. And it's probably the equivalent of like a one year aged cheddar. Aaron avoids using money. Instead, he works for local farmers in exchange for food or a safe place to park his wagon. I'm advertising my main service, which is farm handing and farm sitting. Go ships, go! Chick, 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 chickens, they love fresh water. Today, he's cleaning out the chicken coop. Uh, this is the type of job that farms and farmers really don't like to have to do. Open up and close the, the greenhouse daily. That's pretty much all I have to do in exchange for, for, uh, for staying out here. And it takes forever. He uses YouTube to share his message with others. Thank you to all my new supporters. And his channel has started to generate a small but steady income. I would like for people to take away um, from this footage that there is an alternative way. There's a more purposeful job for you uh, that has much more time available uh, and much more peace. Um, and it's outside the artificial um, economies, cities. Uh, when I'm editing, I edit with uh, just iMovie. It, I, I, one handed, I edit entirely one handed with this thing. Solar panels allow Aaron to charge his devices on the go. This is a 150 watt uh, A10 power solar panel. Uh, this is my 500 watt hour battery that my subscriber sent me. And for things like his portable freezer. Um, I've got him plugged into my friend's uh, outlet here. Aaron's latest idea is turning his sheep's milk into ice cream popsicles. That's interesting. I, I put sea salt in it too. He's headed into town to give out free samples. People pay, pay $5 a piece for like hagen dazs yeah, I don't know, I just feel bad about trying to charge money for In this part of Oregon, temperatures can drop below freezing in winter and top 110 degrees Fahrenheit in summer. Cool, evaporative cooler effect. Since sheep don't sweat, you gotta add, you gotta add the sweat to them. Once Aaron gets within city limits, it's time to whip out another piece of gear. I'm gonna pull over right here and, uh, and put their poop cups on and give them a drink real quick. I forgot to put on their poop cups. Why do you have to do this? I don't have to, I just uh, want to keep it sidewalk sanitary and not you know, give anyone reason to vilify what we're doing. Perfect. Oh my gosh! That, that, one, it, that one is nothing but my sheep's milk and pear syrup that I harvested from the, uh, the cut down pear trees on, on Foss. I, it's so hard to find someone who's so open. It makes delicious ice cream. You wanted the heart, 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 other side. Oh, yes! Oh, I 
I'm so happy. Okay, well, if you want, if you want to try both. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. But Aaron's relationships with locals aren't always friendly. He's not a very nice person. Like he's he's really aggressive. He he's always throwing tantrums and fits. Like he's just aggro. I mean, I don't. I avoid him. I don't know. Aaron used to live in Ashland, Oregon. At some point, Aaron says the local police started ticketing him for walking his animals in public parks. I'm gonna write you a ticket, so and you I'm not taking the, the ticket. Judge. I'm not taking the ticket. You can do whatever you want. No, I'm not you. taking the ticket, and I'm not. That's fine. Eventually, the Ashland City Council passed a law requiring special permits to bring any livestock, except horses, into town. So if Aaron Fletcher gets a horse, he's gonna be able to walk it all over town. That's how Aaron ended up in Talent, which is surrounded by orchards. He built relationships with several property owners who let him stay for free. Yeah. But just as he was getting settled, his lifestyle was put to the test in 2020. Oh my God. Our place is on fire. That September, the Almeda fire blazed through Ashland and leveled Talents downtown. It's in our freaking orchard, no, come on. And I'm making better speed than these cars trying to evacuate. Deep going. That was really scary. Really scary. And if I hadn't gotten out right then, then I would have uh, been trapped. Like our exit would have been engulfed in flames and we would have, wouldn't have been able to get out. By the summer of 2022, much of Talent's commercial center remained empty. Many here still live in a trailer park built by the government that was meant to be a temporary housing solution. Aaron says his way of life can offer ideas to people struggling to find a home. And those people that are in RVs could be happier, healthier, and have more purpose if they had a connection with the local small farmers that need their help right now. Aaron doesn't talk about his past much, but he didn't always live like this. Oh yeah, I was raised like everyone else on soda pop and cereal. He left his parents' home in Kansas City when he was a teenager. Yeah, I thought that that crap was going to hit the fan back 15 years ago when I voluntarily went homeless first. Uh, I thought it was going to happen within, you know, weeks or months. And uh, yeah, here it is, 15 years later or so. At first, he hopped trains with his dog, Sam. Go on. And he used to dumpster dive for food. I just dumped 24 cases of unexpired hummus and six eggs. About 10 years ago, he got more serious about sustainability. He adopted goats, then sheep, and started trying to get all his food from local sources. Aaron has been getting by with his way of living for years now, but I wanted to know how it's affecting his health. So, we hired a local doctor to come give him a checkup. Hi, Dr. Duncan. McLean Duncan runs Siskiyou Vital Medicine. Your oxygen saturation is at 99%, which is perfect. So now we're gonna take your blood pressure. Good, so I got 120 over 80. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Okay. <laughs> yeah, nice. It's gurgled. Nice. I'm taking uh, six vials. Holy shnike, why? Well, because we're t testing a lot of things on you. Oh my God, okay. you shouldn't have told me that. You got a blanket or something we can lay down? What? Yeah, where's the Here, let's lay your jacket down right and then have you lay down. Yep. There we go. Come here, buddy. Come on. One, two, three. There we go. Kick his feet up. This is gonna go out. There you go. There you go, dude. There you go, buddy. That's all right. Oh wow. There you go. I passed out. Huh? Yeah. Interesting. It's a lot of blood, man. Wow, interesting. I had a dream. What dream did you have? I don't know. I feel pretty good about Aaron. Uh, all exams are pretty normal. Great vitals. Uh, he's got great looking skin. Um, you know, he's a little bit thin on the, the body fat, but it seems pretty good. We'll, but we'll find out more in the labs. We reviewed Aaron's blood tests. Aside from lightly elevated cholesterol, probably because of all that milk and cheese, he has no major health issues. Aaron is not completely self-sufficient. I have episodes on me going to the food bank. 
in town. Any food that I consume from the artificial economy, I use it as fuel to then refocus on seeking out these uh, weaning ways. Shortly after we filmed with Aaron, Rosie passed away from bloat, a common cause of death for livestock. But then, Happy had two lambs. Good boy. Yes. And in a new experiment, Aaron raised money from his subscribers to buy a donkey that would help him travel longer distances. Uh, this, is, this is faith, faith the donkey do. So far, he's had mixed results. The donkey caused a major crash that he caught on his cell phone camera. No, no, no. no. Oh my gosh. I'm so lucky to be alive. So lucky everyone else is still alive. So lucky they didn't involve traffic. Aaron Fletcher has sacrificed a lot since he decided to strive to become self-sufficient. But he truly believes that this is the best way he can serve others. That's, that's all I can do is, is to try to um, better all of our hope for the future. And to have help getting that hope out um, is, is even more hope. Has anybody ever called you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Are you crazy? Everyone's a little crazy. <laughs> but no one's, uh, it's no measure of health uh, to be profound, to be, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I'm obviously the least adjusted. So I would say that I'm the least crazy of anyone that I know. <laughs> a gas mask jerry-rigged to pump air is the only thing keeping this sewer diver from choking on toxic fumes. Every day, tens of thousands of people do one of South Asia's deadliest jobs. As long as underground sewers have existed, it's been someone's job to keep them clear. Now, a robot could end this dirty business once and for all. Meet the Bandicoot. It has four expandable legs, four cameras, and a carbon fiber body capable of lifting over 250 pounds. A retractable hose and articulating shovel can access places that previously only human hands could reach. Hands like those of full Kumar Mandal, who used to jump into manholes before he got a job operating the robot. The Bandicoot is part of a wave of robots maintaining cities mostly unseen but absolutely critical infrastructure. And that's good news, because clogs aren't only a problem in South Asia. Pipes are stopped up everywhere, including some of the global north's richest cities. More fat is just going to stick to that and it's going to get bigger and bigger and clog up your whole pipe. So why are sewers around the world getting so much worse? And what can cities do to prevent from drowning in worldwide waste? First, can we just take a minute to appreciate the miracle that you can wake up, walk four steps, do your business, and flush it far, far away? Many early civilizations had open sewers in the streets. And up until a few hundred years ago, people oftentimes just threw their waste out the window. Things didn't start to change until the Industrial Revolution, as city populations exploded and a deadly disease started to spread around the world. Cholera killed millions of people over the course of the 19th century. It's a real nasty way to die. Diarrhea and vomiting until the body runs out of fluids. It took decades for science to reach a consensus that the pathogen spreads through water. And how'd they solve it? Beer. Scientist John Snow noticed that in one neighborhood, those who drank beer, rather than water from a contaminated well, survived an epidemic. By the late 1800s, the world's largest cities kicked off massive sewer building projects. The designs were grandiose and kind of beautiful. In Paris, the sewers became a tourist attraction. Nowadays, much of the world's population relies on an unseen network of pipes and tunnels to carry away their waste. All sewer systems rely simply on gravity. 
In the modern era, the biggest innovation has been the addition of pumps that can help the sewage flow uphill. That's it. The most important technology in city planning hasn't changed that much in hundreds of years. And there is the problem. Cities grow, but their sewers can't keep up. When the London sewers were being built in the 1800s, Sir Joseph Boselgett doubled their size from the original designs. Smart move. But now, the poop is hitting the fan. As are the used cooking oil, baby wipes, and other things that people flush, but sewers were not designed to handle. And shifting climate patterns mean that cities regularly get hit with heavier rains and rising sea levels. All that water can cause sewers to back up into the streets. So, cities have to build bigger and bigger tunnels that come with a huge price tag. In many cities in India, it's cheaper to find people willing to unclog faulty pipes by hand, even though this work has been illegal since 2013. Abolishing manual scavenging is what inspired the founders of Gen Robotics. The company claims that robots like the Bandicoot will actually end up being cheaper over time and eliminate the danger for workers. The four co-founders didn't set out to clean sewers, though. They started out making robotic exoskeletons in college. We felt the, the, the limitation of a human can be drastically improved using technology, so we can do uh, extraordinary stuff like Iron Man. They shifted their focus after a deadly sewer accident near their school. The sanitation workers are working inside the manhole. They fell unconscious. And in order to help them, this auto rickshaw driver also tried, and he also fell unconscious and died. Going from Iron Man suits to sewer robots wasn't easy. The first challenge, understanding India's old and complex sewer systems. The second problem, the manual scavengers feared this invention would put them out of work. They know that we are going to build a robotic device for doing their job, and they are really scared of letting this job go away. Even though everybody says this is an inhuman task, nobody likes to do it. Research shows that 80% of Indian sewage workers die before the age of 60 because of health problems. Gen Robotics set out to educate thousands of scavengers on the dangers of their job, while also hiring some of them to operate the bandicoot. Now, the company is up and running, with almost 300 robots in 18 out of India's 28 states. Sewers in India are especially bad, because its dated systems can't keep up with the booming population. According to India's Central Pollution Control Board, fewer than half of the country's centralized sewers work effectively. Bandicoot robots get to a cleanup site on the back of a truck. Unlike when they go underground without protection, the crews now wear hard hats, high visibility vests, gloves, and boots. Now, the only manual part of the process they still do is removing the manhole cover. Once the unit is in place, operators use the control panel to lower what they call the spider into a manhole. The arms help guide it, while cameras give the operator a close-up view. So this thing works similar to a human hand, like it grabs waste, it collects waste, and the bucket comes to close it, and the waste is being taken to the top. Sensors check for poisonous gas and trigger an alarm if conditions are dangerous. Manually cleaning is not only dangerous, it's also slow. Typically, teams of three to five scavengers could only clean two manholes per day. For operating the Bendicoat robot, only two people is required, and they can clean up to 12 manholes. India is home to 1.4 billion people. And Mumbai, the country's largest city, has around 22 million people. And there are dozens of other gigantic cities in India. The sewers in each one vary. So that means Gen Robotics is always tweaking its designs. Every bandicoot is being custom made. Like what uh, Mumbai needs is not what Calcutta needs. Today at Gen Robotics plant in Palakkad, three bandicoots will roll off the assembly line. Normally, uh, we take uh, like four to ten days uh, to assemble one robot with the same amount of manpower, like four to ten people. Cutting, 
bending steel pipes, and welding. Almost every step of production gets done in-house, and every part must meet the exact specs for a city sewer system. The software and design teams know the Bandicoot's operators might be former manual scavengers with little education. So they did their best to keep things simple. We actually worked with Google and created a beautiful user interface system for doing this. Gen Robotics spent two years developing the Bandicoot before deploying it in the field. Workers assemble the frame housing the controls and the robotic spider arm one bolt and wire at a time. All the sensitive electronics have to be waterproofed. Building by hand slows assembly time, but the company says it's the only way to ensure quality control. Gen Robotics plans to standardize production eventually in order to scale up. It's not an achievement, but it's kind of a what uh, blessing we got to serve the society. But even maintained by innovative technology, sewers everywhere are failing. Why? First of all, the list of things that people flush has gotten longer over the years. More wet wipes, food, and cooking oil enter the system than ever before. Underground, their powers combine to create the unholy monsters known as fatbergs. Masses of inorganic materials and grease that can block entire tunnels. Fatbergs prompted politicians around the world to discourage or even ban non-flushable wipes. So far, these laws have failed to make an impact. In 2021, California passed a law that merely required the makers of sanitary wipes to label their products with a do not flush warning. And in the UK, lawmakers are pushing a total ban on selling drain clogging plastic wipes. It's their third try in five years. Secondly, the huge fixes that some places need are getting way more expensive. For example, when it was first built, the London sewer system cost nearly 400 million pounds adjusted for inflation. Back then, London's population sat at just 2.6 million people. Now, 9 million residents flush more than at any time in history. The city is completing a 15-mile underground tunnel to transport overflow to treatment plants instead of dumping it into the Thames. This single project cost almost 5 billion pounds, 10 times the cost to build the entire sewer system in the 19th century. And thirdly, we've entered a new era of climate change with heavier storms that test sewer capacity more often. New York City's sewers handle both wastewater and storm runoff. Every time a thunderstorm hits the city, the storm drains can back up, spilling billions of gallons of raw sewage into waterways every year. And the flooding can be deadly. In 2022, 11 people drowned in their homes when severe rains overwhelmed the sewer system. So it seems that no matter what cities do, they'll never be able to keep up with their own crap. The modern marvel of flush toilets opened a Pandora's box of problems right under our feet. But there are alternatives. Historically, farmers came into cities and paid for human waste to turn it into fertilizer. Startups are looking into recycling urine to return nutrients to soil. And dry composting toilets are a proven way to let waste break down without water. So the next time you have to go, just think about where what you flush away might end up. These plastic fibers started as buckets pulled from the trash. Now they're used to make rugs as well as prayer mats. At the Hijazi straw mat factory in Gaza, working with plastic waste is the only option. Iyad Hijazi used to import virgin plastic from Saudi Arabia, but since 2007, blockades have made it harder to get anything in or out of Gaza. Stocks of all kinds of important items are down, while trash is piling up. So people across the Strip are finding all kinds of ways to run their businesses with materials recovered from landfills. 
So how do you deal with trash in a conflict zone? We went to the Gaza Strip to see how people make their living off worldwide waste. Donkey carts filled with plastic buckets pull up to this factory almost every day. Workers saw the buckets into pieces to fit into shredders. Washing machines remove any dirt and residue. Some excess water is drained, and the pieces are added to the dryer to spin out the rest. This type of plastic retains its strength after recycling, despite being incredibly lightweight. The plastic is poured into bags and sent upstairs using a lift. Next, plastic bits get loaded into the hopper where they will be heated to their melting point. Adding dyes adjusts the color. Then the pliable sludge falls down to an extruder before being pushed out into long strands. Water cools the plastic until it solidifies. The strands get cut down back into a granule size and end up in these huge sacks. The granules are then sent back downstairs. They're heated up again before being poured into machines specially sized for the mat threads. This time, the machines cut the plastic threads to the perfect size for weaving. Workers bundle the filaments and walk them over to the weaving machines. The factory can produce up to 500 meters of mats every day, but that's way down compared to previous years. When Ayad's father opened it in 1986, the factory ran 24 hours a day with almost 30 employees. Now, there's only one shift a day, and conflict often dictates work schedules. Israeli airstrikes damaged the factory multiple times, most recently in May 2023. Iyad still hasn't been able to rebuild. <laughs> Many of the materials needed to rebuild the factory are hard to find or too expensive, like cement, which was largely banned until 2021. <laughs> The factory keeps running despite the challenges of operating in a conflict zone. In Gaza, electricity is unreliable, running only 14 hours a day on average. Power in Gaza mainly comes from two sources, an old diesel-powered plant that only meets about one-fifth of electricity demand, and power lines from Israel. But diesel is expensive, and there's little place to store large amounts. The Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated parts of the world. It's been in occupied territory since 1967. In 2007, Hamas took control of Gaza. Israel, the United States, and the European Union label it a terrorist organization. Since then, Israel has restricted the movement of people and goods in and out of the 25-mile strip of land. The blockade cut off materials that could be used to manufacture weapons and for other military purposes, according to the Israeli government. We cannot allow um, materials that can be used for weapons that will, will be used against us to cross the border. But the list also included a lot of basic items needed to repair infrastructure. Over time, supplies of building materials, fuel for cars and power plants, parts to fix broken machinery, and even some medical equipment have periodically run out. And the garbage heaps kept getting bigger and bigger.
بتضيق علينا سبل الحياه وبمنعنا من ممارسات حياتنا Mohammed Sabri Musleh, a director at the Water and Environment Quality Authority in Gaza, says the territory produces over 2,000 metric tons of solid waste per day. Gaza's recycling centers can't handle all of it, and the blockade often prevents waste from being shipped to other countries for processing. So, a lot of garbage ends up in the Strip's two official landfills, where it's regularly burned. But because the landfills lack proper firefighting equipment, large fires can burn for days. This one in March 2023 took more than three days to control, and Gaza called for international aid to help put it out. There's so much trash that illegal dump sites sometimes become the only option. <laughs> Since the start of the blockades, unemployment has hovered around 45% in Gaza, and the illegal dump sites have become a source of income for trash pickers, who sometimes burn electronic waste to salvage copper and other metals. That creates clouds of toxic smoke linked to increased cancer rates and respiratory problems for Gaza's children. Even though most Gazans suffer from the waste problems, those trash piles have become a resource. In 2019, one man began recycling paper waste, turning it into trays for transporting eggs. شوف احنا اليوم نعمل عادة تدوير لمادة كانت بتروح للمزابل ما حدش بيستفيد منها نعمل تدوير منها بننتج مادة في احتياجها المزارع. Akram spent two years perfecting the recipe. Workers first rip the trash paper and mix it with water. The proper ratio produces a moldable, thick slurry. Molds press the slurry into the proper shape squeezing out the extra water. Then they dry in the harsh Mediterranean sun. Now Akram employs seven people to make the trays. Unlike the raw materials needed over at the mat factory, egg cartons remained off the list of banned imports. But local farmers prefer the recycled cartons. And every egg is precious. More than 60% of people in Gaza are food insecure. Isolated from the rest of the world, Gaza has been called the world's largest open-air prison but it has about 25 miles of Mediterranean coastline. Ali Mahanna worked with an artist collective to build the Sea is Ours Cafe. Planters made from old tires line the path to the entrance. One of the doors came from a refrigerator. And windows from an old washing machine. Inside, the artists run a community center that teaches locals how to reuse everything. The cafe allows customers to donate waste from their homes in lieu of cash. Despite the war around them, the artists cobbled together a mini oasis by the ocean, spending their days working on community art projects. The cafe and community space provide a modest income for the half a dozen people who work here. And while today seems like a peaceful evening, there are always reminders of the effects of war. كان من البيوت اللي صار فيها هذا الجزء اللي 
اللي بيتم ازالتها لاعاده الترميم Ali is in talks with the Gaza government to open more community centers especially for children وبالتالي كمان بنمرر له نوع من القيمه اللي احنا حابين نحكي له اياها دائما بيحكوا الحاجه ام الاحترام The conflict has forced Ali and Iyad, as well as many other Palestinians, to become unlikely recyclers, making the best out of a dire situation. The packaging for health and beauty products is a recycling disaster. Every year, people throw away more than a hundred billion of these items. And the corporations that make this stuff toss mountains of products that never even hit shelves. Most recycling centers won't take them because they're just too hard to process. But one British business has found a way. I'll tell you the hardest bit is trying not to get burned by the machines. Refactory turns the waste into plywood-like boards. They can be used for anything, from planters to furniture. We decided to go and invest into something that nobody thought would work. As more and more brands want to be seen as sustainable, this company helps them clean up their act. So do these boards have any downsides? And what does it take to recycle the unrecyclable? About a third of the cosmetics waste refactory handles comes from collection boxes placed at stores around the UK. People are only supposed to drop cosmetics packaging, but all kinds of things end up at the factory to be sorted by workers like Curtis. Anything you can think of is be there. He goes through about 20 bags like this every day. So what I'm really looking for here it's metals, glass, and batteries. So they all go to separate sections. Some products have a little of everything in them, like makeup palettes, which often have a glass mirror, metal trays, and a plastic shell. We'll split the makeup palette apart. One will go into the metal pile, and one will go to the glass pile. Palettes from this brand can cost around $50. And like a lot of items in this pile, this one is barely used. I never thought anybody would throw as much as they do away. Sorting like this takes time and money. And that's one reason why many recyclers around the world only take two of the seven kinds of plastic. Plants often reject the other types, along with anything that's too dirty, and send them to landfills or incinerators. Refactory says it doesn't turn anything away. I don't believe there's a material out there that does not have a route to recovery or recycling. But manufacturers throw a lot of items away before they even go to market, including entire shipping pallets of recalled, mislabeled, or expired goods. Brands tend to be pretty secretive about this, so no one knows how much they destroy, but about 70% of the cosmetics waste refactory handles comes from manufacturers, including this luxury perfume by Tom Ford. Perfume is considered hazardous waste, partially because it's flammable. Historically, that material has 100% gone into incineration. Refactory sends the glass and metal elsewhere for conventional recycling. And all of the plastic ends up here in the washing and shredding room. It smells uh, lovely. It's a mix of soaps, um, shower gels, um, perfumes, anything. So, it's, yeah, it's, uh, people like to work in this area. This machine cuts the bottles and tubes into pieces about the size of a peanut shell and washes them with hot water. We'll shred it um, first to make it nice and small so it'll clean better. Then empties are washed two more times. The process requires a lot of water, but the company says about half of this is rainwater it collects and reuses. To recycle the recovered at least three, four times back through the wash. Once the pieces are clean, it's time to shred them even smaller. The material is fed into this big shredder um, where it's got a 20 mil screen on it, so it'll take it down nice and small.
Along the way, a magnet removes some metal pieces, like the tiny springs inside soap pumps. Electrical currents pull out the others. The clean pieces head to the mixing room. This pulverizer grinds granules into a powder, which will become the outer layer. We powder the material down and we mix it in these big mixers behind me. A giant corkscrew inside this machine stirs it all together. The final blends head to the mill. Operators cook up three-layered boards on machines that work like giant waffle makers, laying down the outer coating first. Today's client asked for boards that look like a birthday cake. We put the sprinkles on first, which is um, a bottle caps. The frosting is a white powder layer that provides a smooth finish. It's made from recycled items like bottles, wheelie bins, uh, crates. And the final, thickest layer is the core. That's the very difficult to recycle materials. So I've got mixed polymers and different melt points. That part is key. Pressing it into boards means all the packaging can mix together and nothing goes to waste. Making something more sophisticated, like a water bottle, would mean only using one type of recycled plastic and blending it with a lot of new plastic. This clamshell closes and heats the mixture to about 410 degrees Fahrenheit. Fusing takes about eight minutes. And then we cool down for about 25 minutes. If we did it any quicker, it would be warped, um, but we do it nice and slowly, and then it comes out nice and flat. These cuttings can go right back through the process, along with plastic sweepings from the floor. There's nothing that goes to waste from this process. The boards have lots of uses. Benches, bookshelves, planners, bus shelters. They can even outfit a whole room. It was designed to replace plyboard. We do toilet cubicles and shower rooms and all kinds of weird and wonderful things. But the product isn't perfect. It's not a silver bullet. Obviously, when these are cut and worked on, they do create a microplastic. Conventional methods often have the same problem. Studies have found higher levels of microplastics in the waters near recycling plants. Refactory tries to keep the issue under control by selling finished products, not building materials, so it can deal with the shavings in-house. The key to us is we know where that product is. If that product becomes damaged or they decide to change it, we can recycle it back into the next product for them. Refactory says it can recycle the boards and goods made from them over and over. Even so, there just isn't much demand for products made from this stuff. We gift a lot away, so we do a lot of charitable events, and we run a, a scheme called Skull Cycle. The company encourages its clients to think up uses for the boards, like decorating their offices. We can refit this, we can replace this, so we can go as big or as small as you want. So how does a business turn a profit making stuff people barely want? Well, it didn't at first. This portion of the business, for the first time in the last two years, has become profitable. The revenue mostly comes from clients paying Refactory to take the waste. It's all based around the success of gaining so many brands on board and making a success story out of what we are doing. Clients include Boots Pharmacy and The Body Shop, which have waste collection boxes in many of their stores. People pay for a box, um, and as part of that box fee, you will get your delivery and collection included in there, and also the um, fee to process the waste. And as the beauty industry faces criticism for creating a lot of garbage, more retailers are turning to recycling to clean up their image. So it's really refreshing to actually see brands approach us in the way that they're doing for the first ever time. Here at the body shop, this box fills up about every week. People can put in his personal care products with any brand at all. There's not just body shop items in there. Refactory claims its boards create less planet warming pollution than shipping waste to landfills. What we found was there's actually a 50% saving on carbon with a recycled board versus putting that same plastic into a landfill site. Workers at Refactory said they were proud to be part of an operation like this. Well taking rubbish and we're giving it a new purpose, a new life, so to speak. The company has plans to expand, but it will take a massive scale-up to address the sea of packaging waste. 
Stephen says the ideal scenario would be designing packaging with its disposal in mind. We've always had a, a very hard time understanding why brands bring certain products to market without actually understanding if there's a recycling route for them. Disney World produces a lot of trash. More than 15,000 pounds per day at Magic Kingdom alone. But you won't see it anywhere. The Magic Kingdom has a futuristic system of hidden tubes like these that rocket trash out of sight at 60 miles per hour. Disney's system is top secret though, so we went to the only other place in the United States that handles trash this way and on this scale. Roosevelt Island, the tiny sliver of land between Manhattan and Queens in New York City, has been shooting its trash through tubes for nearly 50 years. This was supposed to be the future of garbage. No more curbside bags, giant trucks, and vermin. Dozens of European cities have systems like this built into their infrastructure. So how did Disney's magical trash tubes end up on a tiny island in the middle of New York City? And why hasn't the system taken off in the US? Pneumatic tubes date back to the early 1800s. They essentially work like giant vacuums, using compressed air to move objects from place to place. Over the following decades, cities across the world began using tubes to deliver mail, as well as medical supplies, banknotes, and at one point, even McDonald's. But the idea was always to move people, like in the Jetsons. By 1870, Alfred Eli Beach developed the first subway in New York City using pneumatic power. It only traveled the length of a city block and was more of a proof of concept than anything else. When Roosevelt Island first opened its doors to residents in 1975, developers had a unique opportunity to experiment with a new kind of waste management. Previously, the island was home to a notorious mental health institution, a smallpox hospital, and a prison. This penitentiary is by far the worst in the United States. The island needed an image overhaul and a solution to trash disposal. At the time, New York City sanitation workers were on a nine-day strike. More than a week went by with no garbage pickups, and people were rioting. The system was inspired by the one in Disney World's Magic Kingdom. It was installed just a few years earlier and is still in use today. So, how do they work? This is Roosevelt Island's AVAC facility. Uh, automated vacuum assisted collection process is, is really what it is. Larry Carrick has worked as the island's senior stationary engineer since 2018. And there's a lot to look after. 1974, I believe this was all put in and operational. This is still functional uh, for the most part. So yesterday was a 17 hour work day. You know, it's part of the job. Every day, about eight tons of trash run through these tubes. Eventually, it all gets compressed into these containers. The city's Department of Sanitation sends special trucks to pick them up three times a day, along with containers filled with recyclables and bulk items too big for the island's AVAC system. The trash goes to a transfer station in Queens. There, it mingles with garbage from the rest of the city and is sent to landfills or incinerators that burn trash to make energy. The AVAC system doesn't solve the issue of where our trash ends up, but it does make the process of how it gets there a whole lot cleaner. All of this happens out of sight for the 11,000 people who live on the island. I've been here for five years. I found out about two, two weeks ago. But the AVAC system is far from perfect. Decades of wear and tear have left the pipes prone to jams and leaks, especially when residents don't understand what the system can handle. Anything you can think of as far as crazy hockey sticks. Somebody threw a bed frame in there. A bunch of carpeting, backpacks. And then I've heard about the infamous mattress and the infamous drawer. It goes around. <laughs> so it's something to laugh at. Fixing these jams requires some creative solutions. So this basically spins when we have the handle on it or a machine. Hopefully it grabs into whatever is, is the jam and we're able to pierce through the garbage. Once we get this in good, we try to rip it out. 
when it comes to bigger repairs, someone has to crawl inside. And these tubes are only 18 inches in diameter. If there's a leak on some of the pipe, we'll have a gentleman that'll actually climb into this area. He gets onto a skateboard along with some welding equipment and he'll end up skating in here so we can weld up the hold it's itself. That's a very simple, intuitive, easy process to use when it works. When it doesn't work, it stinks. But despite the occasional breakdown, many residents prefer it to traditional trash collection. Judith Birdie moved here in 1977, two years after it opened to residents. And as president of the Roosevelt Island Historical Society, she literally wrote the book on it. Oh, what a wonderful book. I think I'll read it. She said she couldn't imagine trash collection any other way. There's no way I want a traditional garbage pickup. <laughs> I love it that we don't have trash on the street. You don't see a rat anywhere to be found on this place. In other parts of the world, AVAC systems have a more modern touch. In Norway, these different cans separate trash from recycling. And in Sweden and Spain, some are even fully automated. So why can't Americans just stuff their trash down the tube? The main reason, of course, is money. Maintaining these systems is complicated and expensive. Also, private developers don't really have any incentive to invest in this kind of infrastructure. One of the guys who builds these systems compares it to a sewer line. How many times you have to flush the loo in your apartment to amortize that investment, right? It's a basic service you have at your house. And installing them is messy, if not impossible. It involves tearing down buildings to lay the pipes below ground. That's especially tricky in New York City. Manhattan has a huge complex underground. Things like the subway system, gas lines, electric pipelines, that it would be essentially impossible to implement an AVAC system like the one we have here. But at the polo grounds in Harlem, New York City's housing authority is giving it a shot. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. For dense buildings and, and for high-rise buildings, pneumatic collection can really save a lot of room on the curb. This will be the first time in half a century that an AVAC system will be installed in the city. The project will cost an estimated $31 million and will service 4,000 residents across four different buildings. It's expected to be completed by summer 2024. If the project works, it could serve as a model for the rest of the city and the country. A Swedish company called Envac designed the Roosevelt and Disney systems, and it's looking to expand its American footprint. We really think there's a huge potential market in the U.S. It's still a long path. We know it is not going to be easy. Roosevelt Island might not be the trashless utopia we were promised decades ago, but advancements in AVAC could lead us to rethink how we dispose of our waste and the infrastructure behind it. Someone's got to take the time. Someone has to have the technology. Around here, this can continue. Someone has to continue to put money into upgrades and producing positive things. This rock hard beam is made from hard to recycle plastic, like grocery bags, bottles, and even electronics. A company called Conceptos Plasticos takes plastic basically no one else wants and turns it into building materials. The finished bricks interlock like life-size Legos. The company makes it easier for locals to earn money picking waste out of dumps or off the street. The mission? To improve the lives of waste collectors and turn trash into something useful, like this schoolhouse. Plastic is piling up in Ivory Coast, a country like many around the world that has almost no formal recycling programs. Could these building materials be the solution? We went to West Africa to find out how to make schools out of worldwide waste. Fatumata is one of thousands of self-employed waste collectors in Ivory Coast. She gathers plastic from this dump site in Abidjan, the country's biggest city. And she likes what she does. 
She's part of an informal collective of waste pickers trained by Conceptos Plasticos. They gather many types of plastic, including stuff other recyclers won't take. Fatoumata says that since joining the company's training program, she makes about four times as much as she used to. Collectors get paid at a local sorting site after workers there weigh and log each bag. Conceptos Plasticos pays 100 CFA francs, or about 16 cents per kilogram of plastic. We try to avoid intermediaries and we try all the time to empower directly the people that is collecting the plastic in the street. Then it's time to start sorting. They take out pieces that can't be used for bricks, like PVC, which can release toxic fumes when melted. All the time we are getting material that we cannot transform, uh, PVC or some, PE, some kind of PET. So that's also their work is to sort again and check again which kind of plastic we are getting and take out the, the PVC. After sorting, they load plastic into a crusher. By flattening the waste, about four times as much fits in each truckload to the factory. This facility can process about 40 standard garbage trucks worth of plastic each month. Workers load hard plastics, like these from electronics, on a conveyor belt, which carries them to a crusher. Every time that you work with plastic, you need to have a small size. We have crushers just to take the plastic maybe five millimeter size. The crushed chips go into a hopper, then travel down the line to be melted. Soft plastics, like grocery bags, go through different machines. But the process is similar. They're shredded into tiny pieces and melted down later. The final mixes combine different categories of plastic in specific ratios. We have two different kind of mixes, one mix for bricks and other one for columns, for structural elements. We have a small percentage of some additives to help the plastic in the machine and everything. The company keeps those recipes a secret, hidden from our cameras behind this curtain, along with the equipment that makes bricks. Behind the wall, we have all the technology and the molds that we develop. That's the way we do the bricks. But they did show us how beams and columns are made by pushing the hot mixture into long molds. Workers lower them into water to cool things down. La moule pour charger. Donc quand on finit de charger, on plonge dans l'eau. Quelques minutes après, on fait sortir le poteau. They remove this rod, and the mold pushes out a beam. The team cuts the beam into shorter segments and drills holes at each end. Any leftovers, like the rough end pieces, go through the whole process again. This school was made from the recycled building blocks in 2019. Les enfants s'achètent beaucoup de choses parce qu'ils sont dans un, dans un environnement très aéré. Il n'y a pas de chaleur et ça résiste aux aléas climatiques. And there are more than 300 classrooms made with Conceptos bricks around the country. Oscar Mendez and Isabel Cristina Gomez started the company in 2010. They're based in Colombia, but in 2019, they got a call from UNICEF asking them to expand their business to another country in need, Ivory Coast. According to the UN, more than a million Ivorian children don't go to school. And sometimes it's because they simply don't have a place to go. Classrooms are too far away or too crowded. Normally they're for 50 children and you can find them up to 80 or so. Teachers, they say that it's impossible to give lessons and to teach in a normal way. Each one of these takes about a month to build. The government, they loved the project from the very beginning, mostly because it was quick. Construction here in Ivory Coast, they can take up years. The government estimates that Ivory Coast needs about 30,000 more classrooms just like this one to end the shortage. So is there enough plastic trash to build all those? Technically, yes. 
the city of Abidjan likely creates enough waste each day to build about 45 classrooms. Collecting, sorting, and transforming all that plastic is the hard part. We need to design a really good sorting process here. Okay, take this out and bring bottles. Bring the bottles, but tell, tell, tell the guy, take okay. this out, chop, chop. Oscar says bringing this process into more communities could be the key. We are solving local problems and the solution should be local. We are trying to see how can we go down with the really small scale and go directly to the people who can maybe make their own bricks and their own products. He says the company has transformed more than 3,000 metric tons of Ivory Coast plastic since it got started here. In the long run, solving the plastic problem means making less of it. But for the foreseeable future, the waste has to go somewhere. And ultimately, the work is about a lot more than using up trash. We are doing good things for the environment and for people. We are really happy to see how people is changing their lives. Their faces, their looks, they tell everything. Because for the very first time, they have something that is their own. Est-ce que vous n'êtes pas content d'être dans cette classe? On est content, non? Si vous êtes content, on applaudit. Voilà. This looks like cotton candy, but it's actually plastic trash spun into soft, ultra-thin fibers. The four people who invented the process were inspired by the childhood treat. We wanted a project that can create a new business model in countries where plastic is abundant. Now their company, the Polyfloss Factory, is deploying these portable units around the world to turn used plastic into insulation. So just imagine a big puff jacket for houses. These covers can help keep basic shelters warm, even in refugee camps. Can a polyfloss machine make recycling easier in parts of the world that are drowning in trash? We went to Paris to see how a company that started as a school project is insulating homes with worldwide waste. It all started in 2011, when four design students in London set out to invent a cheap and simple way to turn plastic into something useful. But it would take them 11 years and eight prototypes to fine tune their technology. The first prototype produced a dense foam. One of the properties that we weren't able to fully achieve was sponginess or squishiness. The next three devices gave off fumes and were unsafe to use indoors. Still, the grad students made all kinds of products, like lampshades, bowls, and headphones. But then, the team nearly called it quits. They disagreed about whether to accept an investment that would have forced them to industrialize the technology. They decided to reject the money and stay small. We made the choice to bet on the team, to preserve our friendship and our trust. We envisioned smaller machines that could be distributed globally to the source of the waste rather than moving the waste to factories. In 2014, they came up with a version that made the thinnest fiber yet. We had it woven, we had it knitted. It was very flexible, very versatile. Then a British architecture school asked them if the wool-like material could be used as insulation, and it worked. Even if it's a shelter, insulation is key and almost non-existent in some part of the world. Finally, in 2020, they released the latest iteration, nicknamed Ellie. Christophe fabricates each component of the machine in-house. Ellie costs about $17,000, weighs 220 pounds when fully assembled, and is the safest, most efficient design yet. But you can't just throw a used bottle in there. The plastic needs to be cleaned and shredded. So they usually buy pellets from companies like Lemon Tree, a local recycler in Paris that accepts over 30 kinds of waste. It handles about 200 metric tons of plastic per year. At Polyfloss, pellets go into the hopper. Shredded plastic works too. The machine can process two of the most common types of plastic, PET and polypropylene. In less than a minute, the melted plastic is extruded through the head. This head is rotating really fast through this motor. 
And then the plastic which is melted creates fibers by centrifugation. They're blown by this blower. The moment you switch on the machine and fibers appear, it's really a magical. Watching the floss pile up can be mesmerizing, but it's also dangerous. It's a machine that melts plastic, so it shouldn't be touched without any gloves. It also, of course, has some smells, so we need to have gas masks and eye protections. We keep the machine in a secure room to contain the microplastic. It takes about 33 pounds of the fiber to fill a 22 square foot cover. This can catch fire. That's why polyfloss needs to be encapsulating in a fireproof fabric. The fabric also needs to be breathable, but still resist water, moisture, bacteria, and rodents. Other types of insulation can be made with recycled materials, like glass and metal waste. But Polyfloss says its product is safer to handle than other popular options. Fiberglass, mineral wool, and spray foam can irritate the skin, eyes, and lungs, so you need protective equipment to install them. You actually can touch Polyfloss and you don't get all the issues you have with uh, rock wool or glass wool. Polyfloss partners with NGOs to ship its machine across the world and make insulation using locally sourced plastic waste. We followed members of the Polyfloss team to a migrant community outside of Paris as they installed insulation in seven homes. About 30 people live here, all from the Ivory Coast. Ici, si le temps le temps de froid vraiment on souffre très très beaucoup parce que il y a les coupures de courant parce que pourquoi il y a des coupures de courant même hier avant tu appuyais il y a eu des coupures de courant. Many built their own homes with cheap materials. À partir de 18h 20h Il fait tellement froid quand tu quittes dans la rue. Tu quittes, tu balades, tu rentres, il fait froid. Maintenant, dès que tu viens, tu fais comme ça. The aluminum covers reflect sunlight, so the panels can also keep the shelters cool in the summer. In 2020, Polyfloss partnered with two NGOs to insulate shelters at a camp in northwestern Syria for people fleeing ongoing violence. They set up production in Gaziantep, a four-hour drive from the camp on the other side of the Turkish border. Most of the waste they use comes from shredded yogurt containers bought from local recyclers. We had to work with really patchy houses and make sure they are safe and warm. Field tests showed the insulation kept the shelters up to 14 degrees warmer in the winter. So far, the project has insulated 22 Syrian homes. Polyfloss also deploys its machines to countries that have little to no recycling infrastructure, like Nepal. Cities around here collectively produce about 350 metric tons of plastic a day. A lot of that ends up in landfills. For the Polyfloss team, making insulation is just the beginning. We know Polyfloss is really small, but we do hope to have one piece of the puzzle to solve something much bigger, to change the way we think about waste to turn into a, an opportunity. They're exploring whether polyfloss could be used for things like food packaging, sanitation, and agricultural products. It's a technology company, but it's very much also a social, political, and ecological endeavor that we're pursuing. We make nearly 50 billion shoes every year, and nearly all of them end up in landfills. Now, a company in the Netherlands claims it's figured out how to recycle footwear, processing up to 2,500 shoes per hour. And some big brands like Adidas say they're trying to cut down on waste too by using materials made from ocean plastic. So why is it so hard to recycle shoes? And are any of the big brand efforts making it easier? Your typical running shoe can contain about 40 different parts and dozens of different materials. These include plastic, nylon, metal, rubber, and something called ethylene vinyl acetate that's basically a kind of foam. For most mass-produced shoes, the layers are held together with powerful glue. And that's what makes these products so hard to break down and recycle. Getting rid of the glue is important 
because any remaining sticky residue would contaminate the separated materials. And shoemakers need these materials in their purest form to make new shoes. Entrepreneurs Danny Pormez and his wife Erna say they found a way to recycle every single part of the shoe. For all the materials, we do have the solution. The company, Fast Feet Grinded, or FFG for short, gets shoes from the Dutch military, from collection boxes in stores, and sometimes directly from manufacturers. They pay FFG to dispose of defective shoes or pairs returned by customers. First, you need to separate them by type. FFG operates a completely automated mechanical system that doesn't use chemicals like glue solvents to separate the different components. Danny tried everything from microwave ovens to irons. Tried to do it myself, uh, dismantling shoes by hand. Did all uh, those full stuff. In the end, a series of machines that use heat and friction proved to be the most effective method. And this is where the magic happens. One machine heats the shoes to remove the glue. Then another separates the different materials. Beyond using heat and friction, the company wouldn't share any further details about its process. But we do know that the final products are separated by type, with the foam and rubber being ground down into tiny particles. So the rubber will be rubber with, uh, without any contamination, without any glue. FFG also isolates the other materials from the shoe, like fabric from the uppers that can be spun into yarn to make new shoelaces, and metals from steel-toed safety shoes. Danny and Erna started their recycling journey in their running shop. I've got a vision, but my wife is a business wife. We started together 20 years ago, and if she wasn't there, uh, yeah, I was totally done. We are willing to change the whole shoe industry. It's very hard, but it's, uh, we are doing it. They opened their shoe store, Runner's World Horn, in 2004, <laughs> offering tailored recommendations to customers depending on their style of running. Danny, an ex-Marine, won contracts to supply Dutch soldiers with sneakers, and then... The Dutch government asked us, yeah, about eight years ago to think about recycling, thinking about uh, a return program, and that's basically how Fast Grinder started. FFG also partnered with ASICS to figure out how to make new sneakers from old ones. But shoemakers say recycled materials come with limitations. If we take our, our highest performance running shoe, making that entirely from circular recycled materials, we won't, it won't have the same functional properties still. For now, the shoes ASICS makes from old materials are not meant for high performance running. Our ultimate goal would be that they are just as functional, just as good as all our running products. And hopefully it will not be just a cool side project, but something that we can really implement into the way we make shoes at large. Companies around the world are trying to figure out how to make a less wasteful shoe. Adidas, which makes more than 420 million pairs of shoes every year, has a couple of products in development. In 2015, the company began making sneakers and other apparel using plastic garbage collected from the ocean. The plastic gets crushed into flakes, heated, and cooled into pellets before being spun into a polyester filament that can be used to make the sneakers uppers. But that still leaves us with a shoe that can't be entirely recycled. In 2021, Adidas unveiled a shoe made entirely out of virgin plastic with no glue holding it together. The Future Craft Loop was designed to be recycled into future generations of the same shoe. Adidas says that using only one material lets it break down the shoe and recycle it without fear of contaminants. But the plan only works if the company can convince customers to return the old pairs. While big companies experiment with recyclable sneakers, researchers at UC San Diego have looked at making footwear from biodegradable materials. Steve Mayfield and his team turned to algae for an environmentally friendly flip-flop. They are the most efficient photosynthetic organisms on the planet. In 2021, we visited Steve's lab in San Diego. 
The process for turning algae into flip-flops is surprisingly simple. The shoe consists of a footbed made from flexible foam, an outsole made of a more rigid foam, and a cotton strap. To make the foam pieces, the researchers use an industrial machine to mix together compounds created from algae oil. This is the same machine you'd see if you went into any one of the shoe manufacturers in the world. We want to make sure that the research and the work we do here is relevant to the real world, to the commercial world. The machine pours the mixture into molds. The team then applies heat and the foam expands into the shape of a shoe. They wait about 10 minutes for the foam to cure, then peel the pieces out and assemble the finished product. You put the strap through here and then put the back two parts here, you glue that on and then this entire thing glues and that's it. That's all the shoe is. So the manufacturing of these things is also really straightforward. The sandal is 100% biodegradable. It takes three to six months to break down in a compost pile, or if it ends up in the ocean, it would take about a year. Steve and his team have partnered with the brand Reef and plan to sell an algae sandal by the summer of 2024. Over in India, another entrepreneur is inverting this process. Instead of saving shoes from the landfill, he's turning the landfill into shoes. Ashe Bave started Daily in 2021, when he was just 23 years old. We profiled his business later that year. Haley because it is the Hindi word for plastic bags. Each pair contains 10 plastic bags and 12 bottles. They clean the bags in a hot tub filled only with water without any added chemicals. And then hang them out to dry. Inside the warehouse, Sairuddin stacks 8 to 10 layers of bags at a time. <laughs> then places the pile under a heat press. This finished product will cover most of the sneaker. The company's founder calls it Daily Tex. So it's a material that's made entirely out of waste plastic bags without the use of any chemicals. Cyrodine packs and ships them seven hours north to the Natush footwear factory. That's where the shoe will be assembled. First, Daily Tech's sheets are die cut using metal forms. Other patterns are cut from our pet fabric, which is made from recycled bottles, and woven into something like canvas. The workers stitch the two types of materials together. The assembled upper gets stretched out. Daily's soles are made from crumbs of industrial rubber. A worker needs to rough the sole on this grinder so the glue added in the next step will adhere. They coat the top of the sole with a clear glue. A special UV light increases its stickiness. The shoes go through a series of heat treatments and coats to strengthen the bond between the sole and the upper. Then comes the final round of stitching. Daly's laces are also made from recycled plastic. This factory employs 170 people and makes shoes for three different companies. We wanted to make sure that we're still using existing sneaker manufacturing techniques. You know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Nitush turns out 15,000 pairs of shoes every week, and they try to recycle everything, even scraps. It's recycled, and some of it is also reused to make more Thaley Tech sheets. The company sold 300 pairs of sneakers in its first month and says the shoes are built to last. It's extremely durable. It lasts like any other sneaker for about two to three years, depending on how it is used. Back in the Netherlands, Willem Tertola's company is using old shoe materials on a new mini soccer pitch. Uh, Danny uh, gave me a call because he uh, saw, saw that uh, on the internet that I make artificial rubber floors. And he uh, wanted to talk with me about the possibilities and the ideas he had about recycling uh, uh, shoes. This is the beginning of something. Workers mix the ground shoes with a polymer binder and spread it over a concrete foundation to provide a soft and bouncy surface for play. It's a fitting new life for many of the sneakers that may have been worn by the people who play here. 
a company called Exclusive International turns FFG's materials into displays, like these ones at ASIC's headquarters. We're bringing between 45 and 60% of the grind in the material, and we bring them back in this sheet material. This is specific PVC from Dr. Martens also. Here you can see the yellow stitching back in the regrind. Back at FFG, Danny and Erna are still honing their process, occasionally with the help of their four children. The family has faced many hurdles, including a fire that completely gutted their first recycling plant in 2022. Uh, so every, everything burned down, um, nothing been saved. But within 10 months, their new facility was already up and running. Most of the people in the beginning, they are laughing, but now they are saying to us, my God, what, this is so, so good that you have been fighting to do this, to make it right and to get it done. It's a family business. It's a family business with passion and with a strategy yeah, on for long term.